Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to call the regular meeting of City Council with the Committee of the Whole uh, meeting for uh, Monday, August, October 26th uh, to work. And uh, our first item of business this morning is our delegations. And it's a real pleasure this morning for me uh, to have our first delegation uh, in to receive a medal of uh, presentation. And so I'd like to call up Bob Fulton, uh, our Dawson Creek Fire Chief, uh, for presentation. So there's uh, not too many occasions where you get to present a long service medal of uh, presentation uh, for 40 years of service. And uh, I was just saying that's longer than I've been alive. <laughs> and uh, so how cool is that? <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's amazing, honestly, when you think about that perspective of 40 years of service and uh, there's a very few that would ever achieve that uh, accomplishment. And so certainly it's a real honor today, Bob, to present you with the a Long Service Medal of uh, Presentation. And we want to congratulate you and thank you, uh, honestly, on behalf of all of the residents uh, from the city of Dawson Creek and the surrounding region for your service uh, to our community and region. I'm shaking hands. Uh, yeah, so maybe we'll do that if we can, our next one, and we're going to just hold Bob uh, for a minute because we want to uh, introduce um, and do a formal introduction, so we're going to have Marcel come up and... <coughs> so it's uh, obviously a real pleasure this morning to introduce to the City of Dawson Creek residents and community. Uh, the newest uh, member of the ranks of the chief of the Dawson Creek Fire Department, Marcel Capel. And obviously, Mars has been, a, I'm not sure, born and raised, but pretty close. Pretty born and raised, pretty much. Uh, spent his entire uh, life in Dawson Creek. And how cool is that for us to have uh, somebody who's started in the ranks of uh, our fire department, uh, serving our community, a uh, local individual, and given that time and now we get the honor of uh, having Marcel as the chief, and so it's a real pleasure to welcome you on board. Uh, thank you, uh, and we look forward to having you uh, continue to serve uh, the residents and community and get your 40 years service. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Our next uh, delegation this morning, uh, we have Tina Hill and Athena Robertson from the Ministry of Children and Family Development. Uh, we're going to do a Foster Family Month proclamation. So maybe if we can have you come up, ladies, and we'll do the proclamation, and then we'll give you the delegation. Come up there? Sure. Then I can read it, and we can <laughs> social distance. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Whereas thousands of British Columbia foster families pro pro provide alternate family care for children temporarily unable to live with their families. And whereas foster families are an integral and valued part of the team of public and private professionals serving the families and children of British Columbia. And whereas foster families are asked to provide emotional support and care for children who will eventually return to their own families. And whereas fostering is a community responsibility and foster families build stronger communities. And whereas the city of Dawson Creek wishes to recognize the care, compassion, and unselfish commitment of foster families within its boundaries and surrounding areas, now therefore I do hereby proclaim the month of October as Foster Family Month in British Columbia. So, I want to thank you guys for coming in this morning. I'll give you that. And you. Uh, obviously the appreciation on behalf of all the children uh, who find their way into the need of a foster family is uh, unbelievable to me. And uh, I just can't imagine uh, how uh, special that uh, work is for you guys to be able to provide that support for those children. And so we really want to express our appreciation and thank you for coming in today. And if you have any few words you'd like to say, behalf of uh, foster families and sure. 
I'll just still start by acknowledging the traditional territory of the Treaty 8 First Nation that um, I get the pleasure of working on and raising my family. Uh, foster families have a really important job. They open up their hearts and their homes to our community's most vulnerable children and youth. So I just really want to thank you in helping us recognize that today. Thank I, you so much. I love your new side. Thank you. Yeah, it's every day. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Great. Congratulations. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, delegation uh, this morning is Samantha Tegmeyer, a res registered respiratory therapist from the Dawson Creek District Hospital. And we're going to do the Respiratory Therapy Week proclamation. Uh, Samantha here. Oh, come in, please. Thank you. Sorry. I didn't hear you come in, so that's great. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to have you here this yes, morning. Thank you. Whereas the Canadian Society of Respiratory Therapy, CR, CSRT, celebrates Respiratory Therapy Week annually. And whereas this week long celebration serves to educate the public about the varied roles of respiratory therapists and of their significant contributions across the healthcare system. And whereas respiratory therapists provide essential care to patients of all ages, they use their expertise in the assessment and management of respiratory diseases, in patient and family education, and in the resuscitation and stabilization of critically ill or injured patients. And whereas the City of Dawson Creek respiratory therapists have been on the front lines of planning and responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas respiratory therapists have been instrumental in preparing at every level advising government, mobilizing supplies, designing pandemic ventilators, and adjusting protocols to the best function under the parameters of this new highly contagious infection. And whereas respiratory therapists have continued to provide essential care to patients who have not been affected by COVID-19. Now therefore I do hereby proclaim the week of October 25th 30 to 31st, 2020 as Respiratory Therapy Week in Dawson Creek. Thank you so much for coming in this morning. It's a real pleasure yes, to you. meet you and welcome you. And I appreciate you raising this uh, important uh, uh, forward for us. So, and it, the floor is yours if you'd like to say a few words. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody, um, me and my fellow co-workers in the South and the North Peace are, are very appreciative of, of this and uh, the recognition. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great okay. week. Appreciate okay. you coming in. Okay. Uh, our next delegation this morning, 2.5, we have Aaron Bowl, Jesse Curiana, and Nicole Graff from the Dawson Creek Minor Hockey Association are in attendance to give an update and a request to council for uh, the Kid Arena. Good morning, Aaron. Welcome. Hey, how's it going, guys? Good. Uh, yeah, we're just, uh, my name's Aaron Bowl. I'm the president of Dawson Creek Minor Hockey. This is Nicole Graff. She's one of our board members. And we're just, uh, we just would like to get the, uh, Kid Arena open up for our, our kids and our youth. And I'm just gonna, we sent you a letter, but I'm just gonna read through it real quickly here. Uh, Dust Creek Minor Hockey is very disappointed in the city of Dust Creek for having, after having been informed that the Kid Arena will not be open this year. We've been told it's been taken out of the budget. Parents, local tax players, and members of this community, we feel that it sends a message that both, that our major youth winter sports and quality of life in Dust Creek is not a priority. With the COVID-19 restrictions in place on the Association of the Athletes of the Province of BC, we believe the Kid Arena is even more essential this year than in years past, as provincial restrictions have been put in place to limit gatherings and buildings. This has also limited the number of participants that we can get on the ice. Normally, DCMHA will have up to 60 players on the ice at any given time, especially in the younger divisions. Most divisions in minor hockey typically have more than one team to practice together. However, due to the COVID-19 restrictions, we've had to divide the divisions into smaller groups and teams. Because of this, our ice time requirements have increased, and with the current ice schedule, <coughs> we have approximately lost 40% of our ice from the years past. The youth user groups have also seen a huge drop in ice availability. Oh, sorry, all the youth user groups. Uh, there's a lot of children that are not getting to participate in these sports, and people who have withdrawn because they're seeing their value decrease. It's extremely difficult to run a nonprofit sporting organization to offer people. Less than the years past, the same amount, while asking the same amount of money. 
BCMHA is paying the same hourly rate and the rights requirements are greater. However, our cost of registrations have remained the same. We cannot raise registration fees while people are suffering from unemployment loss and cutbacks in pay. The direct impact of BCMHA may have long lasting implications as we know once players leave the sports, it's difficult to get them back. Since the schedule has come out, our registration of BCMHA has said several players withdraw from the season due to lack of registration fees paid and impact directly due to not being offered. Uh, we feel, you know, I'll continue reading this, but essentially we feel that, you know, especially up here in Northern Health, or Northern Health, Northern, in the North here, there's not a ton to do in the wintertime. Uh, we have, the third year before the season started, the registration was at 292 children. We have dropped down to 250. We've had a lot of the older kids drop out because we don't have to play games. And if we're not playing games, they're going to go find something else to do. What they're doing, I'm not sure. Uh, but that's kind of where we're at. We're having the older kids have a lot of problems be, right now because they're not, like our, our 16, 17 year olds and our senior girls, they're on the ice every night until 10 p.m. because that's the only ice we can get. Some are 13 years old. Yeah, so we're going to school the next day after playing. So practicing at 10. And we also have our, our learn to play group, which is all our younger kids. The only nights we could find them was 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. Some of them are still in school. Or in terms of getting them to school or just to get them in the rink, that's the only nights we have available right now. Uh, we've lost, like I said, we lost 40, mostly of the older kids. And uh, and we've also lost two or three already to outlaw leagues that were incurring and stuff because we've got no games with them. So they're pulling the kids out and they're going to go play somewhere else. And I've heard a couple people, you know, no one's done it yet, but they're like, why do I, why am I going to continue living in this city if my kid can't get place that he needs? If we can't find ice, we're going to, we're going to maybe look somewhere else, right? Not everyone's got ties to the city like I do, or this area like I do. And if they find a better opportunity, they might lift up and leave, so. It, it's a tough one, right? And we had a petition online there. Uh, we had a thousand, almost a thousand people sign it. And I don't know if you guys seen it or read the comments. There's a lot of good comments there. And it made a lot of sense. Do you have anything to add there, Nikki? Uh, with the petition, some of the comments were from people that are not even involved in minor hockey, but they see the value, a third party value. They see keeping the youth busy, healthy. Um, never mind the adults that aren't getting to play the adult leagues because there's no ice time for them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Aaron. Amanda, thank you for coming in this morning and uh, raising this issue. Council, questions, anybody? Comments? Councilor Parzel? Just in case I misheard you, did you, what was the number of participants you, you, you cited? We had uh, start of the year, we had 292, now we're down to 250 youth participants. We've also, uh, we used to, last year, previous years, each team had a 6 a.m. practice about once every six weeks. That's doable, but now we're having one a week or one every two weeks, depending on the age, the team. Uh, some of the kids are not practicing from 7 till 8, or 7.15 to 8.15, so they're late getting to school. Yeah, the other town kids are And that's not once every six weeks, which is manageable, doable. This is on a regular weekly, by weekly rotation. The every other week, you have morning practice. This morning, you guys. And we're still, we went from having Every kid having about two and a half hours of ice during the weekday, weekdays and then about two to three hours of ice, depends if they had a game on the weekends. Now we're down to two hours on the weekday and even an hour 15 minutes on the weekends. And you know, that, not the greatest time. So we have our pretty novice group going on at 6.45 right now, Sunday morning, because that's the only time we can fit Thank you. Other questions, Council? So thank you for coming in this morning, raising this with council. We will bring the uh, issue and request back under mayor's business later in the agenda. And council will uh, have their discussion about it at that time and a uh, decision will be made and we'll uh, advise you of that uh, later this morning. Thanks for coming in. Uh, thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you for the work you guys are doing uh, on minor hockey as well. Volunteer. Uh, 2.6, our next delegation, and we'll just give, uh, Bring a second.
We have Maria Cameron, Eleanor Ryan, Miranda Rizzi, and Diane Ridley are here from the Dawson Creek Dog Park Society, and they're here to present to council um, on the dog park. So, um, good morning, welcome. It's good to have you guys here this morning. It's good to see you, and the uh, floor is yours. What's up? Welcome. The floor oh. is yours. Oh, yes. Um, we had, well, you guys had concerns about safety, Councillor Wilmer did. So we wanted to address those. And then these two ladies here, Eleanor and Diane, are daily park users. So they're going to address the park like how, well, I'll just get the floor to them. We'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first off, thank you, Councillors and Eleanor, um, for having us here today. Um, I know one of the concerns that was brought up was the safety, um, both with it being in the proximity of a school and a playground, um, and the off-leash dogs that were seen in the area. Um, as someone who, as Maria has said, is there daily with my dog Killian, um, I can honestly say that the majority, and by the majority I mean 99% of anyone I've ever seen come into that dog park where the dog was off leash um, has absolutely been people that don't then continue on into the park. They're using what seems like the Backwoods Creek area there and then also the large field to the other side of the enclosed park. Um, anybody who ever has, and I would say it was going back to sort of the beginning of the inception of the dog park, that were allowing the dogs to come off leash. Um, I believe there's a real family and a real community in that dog park, and we've all spoken to the effect of, hey guys, let's be careful, let's keep our dogs on our leash. Um, we also use it as an opportunity when leaving the dogs on leash to go in through that first baffle gate and allow the other dogs that are already in there to kind of smell and get a sense of the dogs coming in so that it's an easier adjustment for the dogs moving forward. Um, it's also something that when I do walk my dog on leash, um, be it on the Dawson Creek Trail system or at Lepke Park, I notice a large number of people there as well with dogs off leash. So it's unfortunate, but I, I believe that a group of volunteers um, that are doing such diligent work to look after the park itself in that enclosed field can't also be expected to look after other areas outside of that park. Um, however, they tried to. Um, as quickly as there was concerns about the off-leash area, um, myself and Diane actually with Hudson were at the dog park, kind of I would say within a week anyway, um, and there we saw the signs going up saying dogs must be on a leash dogs must be on a leash. I think there was three posted while we were there. Yeah, but while we were there, there was three put in the ground. Um, and I think that's a credit to the society and the volunteers working there that they are being so diligent with the concerns brought forward. Um, I believe there was also concern about the amount of dog poop um, that was left around where children are. Um, again, I can speak to those of us in the dog park um, we very often will kind of say, hey Diane, it's your turn, or Janelle, it's your turn, you're up, um, in terms of keeping an eye on each other's pets. Um, if you're involved in a conversation, you're playing with another dog, whatever the case may be. Um, we also kind of take turns, there's quite a few of us, um, doing perimeter walks. So it's not just to make sure that inside the dog park, you know, there isn't something broken or there isn't something left behind that might injure one of our dogs or each other. Um, but we also then do our community pickups. So if there was something left behind, if somebody missed something, um, we always, as a community, work to pick that up. And I can say the same for that walk from the top of the hill down into the park. Same thing, every one of us has our little poop bags with us. And again, if we see something in that area, um, we're very happy to clean that up as well. Um, <laughs> Look, if it keeps the dog park, I'm happy. Um, I can also just say that as someone who moved to Dawson Creek about three years ago, um, I don't have children, I work full time, um, and I'm of a certain age, uh, it gets more and more difficult to sort of make friends. Um, and both myself and Killian have had the opportunity to make some wonderful friends um, through the dog park. It's been a great um, support system. I know we kind of take turns, we'll dog sit or puppy watch or whatever the case may be for each other. Um, it's a great resource for just talking. Um, and I mean, for myself, when 
you know, I can work a 12, 14 hour day. It's great to know that I can go home, I can get my dog, I can call up one of Killian's friends, say we're heading to the park, I'm on my lunch break, and I have a safe, enclosed area that he can run, he can get the exercise he needs and deserves, um, as well as the play that he needs and deserves. Um, and I don't have to worry that I'm going to spend the rest of my day looking for him because he's <laughs> run off somewhere. Um, and I know that he's in a safe area. Thank you, Eleanor. Yeah, she pretty well sums it up, eh? <laughs> <laughs> That's two ways of saying it. No, it's been, um, we were just talking out there earlier saying that you can tell the dogs that go to the park and the dogs that don't go to the park. There's a huge difference between those animals. Like, these dogs are socialized. And again, I've made some amazing friendships being in this society. It's been great. Um, we do a lot of stuff with the community, like Community Cleanup Project. Uh, Mayor Bumstead was nice enough to come out and help us with that. <laughs> um, so I did want to bring up to you guys, I think you already know, uh, that the BCSPCA is not going to commit to a dog park at this time. So um, I'm thinking that we could start looking at alternative places um, perhaps, uh, well, Barbary Park right now, if, um, if being too close to the school temporarily, maybe we could move to Barbary Park. I know that the disc golf uses that, but we don't need the other dugout that they use. So I don't think we would impose on them too much. Um, uh, for a permanent location, we were going to propose Grandview Park, or I believe Paul brought up before Chamberlain Nature Park, a part of that. Sorry, I would have said your last name, but I can't pronounce it. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so uh, there's that to look at, and we're also hoping to get another 12-month extension at the location we're currently at, or Barbary Park. Thank you, Maria. Um, Council, questions? Council Parcel? Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm one who's glad we have a dog park in our community. Um, it's uh, been a long time coming in the sense of it's the mayor, of course, uh, was very keen initially as well yeah. of dating this. But I'm a little lost here with, with part of the, your presentation, your written presentation. Okay. Um, you say we request another 12 month extension. Was there, was this, um, I've lost track, was this a temporary arrangement? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I was okay. under the understanding that we were going to come up to council every 12 months to kind of update you guys to see where we're at. Okay. And of course, because of COVID, that really has set us back because Pet Value has a Paw Month. And Pet Value said that we could get all the funds from Paw Month, that was $15,000 or up to 15,000. So all of that was canceled, all of our fundraising was gone. So, yeah, so okay. we're no further ahead than we were really a year ago, except for we got lots of community support, but another 12 month extension and then maybe we could revisit again. Right. Okay, I understand that now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councillor Javekov. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just curious, how much money have you raised so far? Um, we had a few thousand dollars raised, but again, the insurance is, uh, it was $1,400 last year, and then it went up 10% again this year. Yeah. Um, there's also the signage that we had to pay for, just like upkeep with the car. Um, thank goodness we have volunteers to help us mow. Um, so, and then when you put on events, you tend to spend a little bit of money. So, and then everything's kind of come to a stop. So, the savings that we did have, uh, we had a nice um, contribution from Peace Country Filtration. So, anything that goes into our savings account stays in the savings account. It doesn't come back out. Unfortunately, that's only twelve hundred and fifty right now. Um, we do have some in the checkings, but we'd like to keep that just in case we need it. So, yeah, not very much. And then it kind of dwindles away when when you don't have any more fundraising going on. But we do have some plans to do some like COVID friendly fundraising. So hopefully we can, I don't think it's gonna be like what it was before. So we're just gonna do the best we can hopefully until this is over and then get back to real fundraising again. Even um, Brown's dealership was gonna come and help us in the newspaper. We were gonna do the reporter in jail, <laughs> all kinds of fun stuff, but everything was canceled. Anything further? Councillor Kemp? So thank you for your presentation today. I just have a question. Um, have you guys received any complaints um, from the dog park? Has anybody reached out to you? Yes, people okay. have reached out to us. And I actually wrote a little something on that. Um, our response to anyone that reaches out to us is and uh, always has been swift. 
Unfortunately, we cannot control the actions of people who do not use the park. We have paid for signs and the city installed them to encourage people to leash their dogs while in Newby Park. We drive by during our work days to try to enforce the leash rule, rule and to be honest of late we no longer see people not leashing their dogs. Uh, we have also asked people that frequent the park if they are running into these issues. Their answer is every once in a while they see somebody with their dog off leash but it's not too often anymore. So but those are the cl complaints we have. And then of course there was the animal control officer, there was that, that was in Newby Park again. And he actually went there to tell these people to leash their dogs. So when he got there, unfortunately, that incident happened. And he wasn't able to locate them or track them down because he was pretty shaken up and understandable, right? After what happened. But honestly, I don't think that that guy will ever come back because there was a pretty big deal about it. So nobody ever seen him again or his five dogs off leash. So I, I don't think we'll see him again. <laughs> Go ahead. Just one more question sure. as well. I'm just wondering, just wanted to confirm the hours of the park. What is it open? So that's been, it's still up in the air. As of right now, people can use the park whenever they want to. Um, we were thinking about putting hours on the park and perhaps locking the gate because of, you know, illegal activity after dark. <laughs> um, but there's so many people, we did reach out to the community and people work odd hours and they want to have access to the park. So we could do like an early morning, late at night, but again, you know, people use the park after dark and it's the only time they have. Sometimes, especially winter hours, it's dark for most of the day and then these people don't have access to it. So that's kind of the issue we're running into. But that's again, why Barbary Park, we want to bring that up because there's parking right there. It's right by the trail. It's a little bit more accessible to people, especially when it's dark out. So, and that people that, you know, in wheelchairs or such, they can't get to the dog park right now. And again, close to the school. So maybe something to think about. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Just one more question. So if you do relocate, um, mm -hmm. you know, the Baffle Gate is currently at that location. Would you be setting that up? Like, so for instance, Barbary Park, would you be setting that up? Would there be more costs for you to move? What does that look like? Yes, there would be costs to move. However, we did have, I'm not sure, don't quote me on this. Like, so when we did get the fence, Tumblr Ridge Search and Rescue has offered to install that for us, which is amazing for their volunteer hours. Um, so there is people to reach out to to see if they could move the Babel Gate for us without any cost. So I don't think the cost would be huge. I don't know if the insurance might change because it's a little closer to the trail. Um, but again, that's, I don't think the cost would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Council Parson? Well, now I, now I do. So what's your preference? To stay where you are or to move to Barbary? Well, our preference has always been Barbary Park, right from the beginning. Um, however, we just, uh, I believe, I'm not sure exactly why, I think Disc Golf uses that ball diamond. I yes, believe it, that's they, what it is. Yeah. Um, however, it's just because of the ongoing safety concerns and, you know, the complaints to the city, um, we just thought that we would satisfy everybody, you know, uh, dog owners and people that don't own dogs and parents and the school board if we were at Barbary Park, because we're not in the vicinity of a playground or next to an elementary school. I can speak to that. Yeah. Oh, yes. And actually, Diane lives right across <coughs> from the park. Years, I've lived on that corner, and I've watched all sorts of wonderful and non wonderful things happen in there. And it's been a, a long going park and area for people to walk their dogs off and on. Uh, since we've got the dog park, there's a lot more. Uh, traffic, shall we say. The parking does become an issue. You get into the park, I've watched people fall down in the winter because of the ice. I've watched them turn around in the spring and come back because they didn't wear hip waders to get there. <laughs> it floods out so badly. Uh, and they can't get there between the school hours of let's say 8.30 and 9 and quarter after 2 and quarter to 3 because all parents picking up their kids. So on that point, Barbary would be a better location and as far as any incidences in that park in the 20 years, the only one I can recall was with the animal control officer. And having been a, a retired letter carrier, I know what it's like having a dog charging. It is very, very unnerving. It took me 10 to 15 minutes to stop shaking. So I can't imagine how he felt with five. And I have not seen that person in that park again. And I can vouch for what they both said most of the dog park users are leashing their dogs. They walk down there, 
You might let them go 10 feet before the gate because mm -hmm. the dogs are so excited to get there. <laughs> but other than that, the users themselves do um, adhere to the rules and are uh, good with their attitude towards other people. And no problems inside the park and when there is, those of us that do use it have, you know, stepped in and suggested, well, maybe you should go or don't bring that dog in or, or even other owners will say, well, we're just going to put him in the dugout for now and then, you know, let the other one run around and then we'll go. It's perfect. We've all kind of got our own little rules and regulations going on there, and it works quite well. And as you said, it's become quite a little family. We've met a lot of people, done a lot for other people. But Barbary is a better location for the parking, the accessibility. My husband can't get down there because he can't walk that far, so he can't come in and enjoy and meet all these people either. The elderly can't. And as far as Barbary, we only need the one dugout for people to sit and relax and watch their dogs for those that can't. And you've been gracious enough to let the physical mm -hmm. gentleman use the other part. I'm sure we can make work something out so he can access his stuff without coming into the park. Mm -hmm. We can figure it all out. Yeah. But it's just, the dog park is an awesome idea. We've had dogs all our lives. We have one place where you know they're safe, that they can run and play and interact like they should, as dogs do, is absolutely wonderful. Because off leash in a field, you're always worried. You know, I know my dog's really good, but he's going to listen to me this time. Maybe he got something just in your pocket. I don't know, maybe the kid's got an ice cream. So this is way better. And it's, it's been a wonderful asset. Wonderful. It's genuinely been a game changer. For myself and Killian, I can speak to that. It is a game changer. It's convenient for me, but I don't mind going to Barbary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Council, further questions, anybody? So, um, first of all, thank you for um, having the, um, the passion to continue to uh, develop this uh, park and the volunteer hours that I know you guys put in, grass cutting, and I followed along, and they're cutting the grass and maintaining it and uh, looking after it. So we really appreciate that, providing that amenity in our community, and it's volunteers that have allowed that to happen. So we really appreciate that. and so. Um, can I just ask our staff, the agreement was one year, is that up now or what's the terms of the current time? Thank you, through your worship. The term ended in September and yes, it was one year. Okay. And council had indicated we would like to have a review of it after one year to be able to review the operation and the issues and terms and all of that stuff. So that's what today is about for council. Thank you. So, uh, so thank you again. We'll um, we'll bring the um, discussion back uh, under Mayor's business later in the agenda, and uh, we appreciate you guys coming in this morning. Thank you, and uh, it's good to see you. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> 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 I didn't. <laughs> three new counselor business. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Paul? <laughs> um, item four minutes. Uh, minutes for a public consultation with council for October 5th, 2020 for adoption. Councilor Parslow, second. Councilor Kemp. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, item 4.2. We have the minutes of our public hearing of council for October 5th, 2020 for adoption. Councillor Kemp, Councillor Parslow, all in favor? Opposed, carried. And 4.3, we have the minutes of our regular meeting of council for October 5th, 2020 for adoption. Councillor Parslow, Councillor Kemp, all in favor? Opposed, carried. Uh, is there any business arising out of any of the minutes for anybody? Thank you. Uh, item six is correspondence 6.1. We have an email from Randall Hadlin and Roger Brainton uh, in regards to climate change and uh, Site C. Councillor Parzlo. Receive for information. Move to receive for information. Second, Councillor Javekov. All those in favor? Opposed? <coughs> it's carried. Thank you. Uh, 6.2, we have a letter from Dr. Bonnie Henry, the Provincial Health Officer regarding the public immunization, immunization clinics during COVID. Councillor Parson, received for information. Second, Councillor Javekov. 
All in favor? Opposed? Carry. Thank you. Uh, 6.3, we have an email from Natalie Kaiser, the, a resident of Dawson Creek regarding BC Transit. Councillor Javekov? Receive for information. Thank you. Second? Councillor Parzal? All in favor? Opposed? Carry. Good Blair? Your Worship, if you would like, I can provide a, a brief update on where this is at. So we, uh, with the changes in the bus service in Dawson Creek, um, that kicked in this year. We, since school started, uh, and with the issue of COVID, the BC Transit is only running their buses at about two thirds capacity. So a number of times in the mornings <coughs> and the afternoons, particularly those two, the city maintained those bus routes and those bus times as they were in previous years, because the largest ridership on BC Transit in the city of Dawson Creek is school children. Uh, failing those times, um, the limited numbers on the buses are, are evident. What's happened, we have contacted both the school district as well as BC Transit, working together to try and resolve this issue. BC Transit is presently uh, looking at two things, either increasing capacity on a site-specific basis back to 100%, which we believe will correct uh, the pass-up situation that's happening now. Uh, failing that, they're looking at in putting in a larger bus so that more uh, people could get on that bus. In the meantime, we had a very good meeting with the school district who has agreed to open the schools earlier and keep them uh, open later for students to catch the earlier bus on the BC Transit system at this point. So uh, we're hoping to hear from BC Transit early this week based on an additional or a larger size bus, not an additional bus or a full capacity, but we will keep you informed as soon as we have that information. In the meantime, I know the school was working and they had to, uh, I believe, adjust some scheduling and so on. So probably if it isn't uh, dealt with today, it will be in the very immediate future where those operating hours for the school would allow students in. Becomes more of a, an issue as winter sets in on us as we see out there today. Blair, and I guess one of the things I was thinking about on uh, that was our schedule. Is there any way we could adjust the schedule to, to make it that 8.15 or 8.30, so then you got that uh, two opportunities either before 8.30 or after 8.30 to be able to make that connection for school for the kids rather than at 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock? I believe there's two now prior if you t catch the okay. earlier bus. Uh, that's so the schools would open earlier to accommodate that. Okay. Um, I think the real issue, and I know that we had uh, an individual say that even last year there were pass ups, I was unaware of that. Um, certainly as a, an elected official or with the city we haven't received those calls but I think there's a way to find a path forward here but it will take BC Transit's uh, work on this as well. Good. Well I, I think we certainly uh, ensure we keep that uh, to them that the uh, issue of them redu arbitrarily redu reducing capacity uh, for our uh, ridership. You can get on an airplane with a mask at full capacity yet you can't get on a bus to a transit bus for 15 minutes for the kids to get to school doesn't make sense to me. And so thank you for that update. Uh, 6.4, we have an email from Pat O'Reilly, Vice President of Bear Mountain Nordic Ski, looking for a letter of support. Councillor Park. I move that we write a letter of support for Bear Mountain Nordic Trails uh, upgrade project. Thank you. Second, Councillor Kemp. Discussion? Councillor Parzal? Well, the uh, great deal of volunteer work over many years has produced a fantastic asset for our region and uh, I think anything we can do to help them, it doesn't cost us anything, but it does provide many citizens a wonderful winter pursuit. Yeah, absolutely. I think if anybody hasn't been up to that facility and seen the trails, the ski trails and the snowshoe trails and all of the infrastructure that they've built uh, up there. It's really amazing and a credit to the group that have led by Pat to get that stuff done. So I'm in complete agreement. Further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, 6.3, we have a letter from Bridget Shoemaker uh, and Rochelle Greek from the Mauser Figure Skating Club uh, dealing with the same agenda that Minor Hockey brought forward with uh, in regards our request for uh, support to uh, the Kin Arena ice. So perhaps if we could uh, just 
receive for information as we are going to deal with this later on the agenda. That's what I was. Yeah. Councillor Parzel, second. Councillor Kemp, second. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. 6.6, .6, we have a letter from Rhonda Vanderflut, the Registrar of the Youth Parliament of BC Alumni Society. Information. Councillor Parslow received for information. Second. Councillor Javekov, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, item 7, reports. 7.1, we have report number 2199 from the Watershed Coordinator regarding uh, our uh, Emergency Preparedness Fund for a Structural Flood Mitigation application. And so perhaps first if we could have a receipt for discussion so that we can get an update. Councillor uh, Kemp, second. Councillor Parslow, all in favor? Opposed, Carrie. Blair, Kevin? I'll ask Kevin to deliver this one. It is the, based on the report that's attached. Good morning, through your worship. Um, so what you have is the report. Um, the watershed coordinator had put forward a request um, to try and meet the UBCM uh, grant opportunity. But I think it's an opportunity, obviously, to discuss. This is the first time that we and council have seen the kind of initial results on the 102nd Avenue crossing design that was uh, tendered early in the year. So what you'll see is uh, a couple options came through that process and Morrison Hirschfield provided uh, a crossing that uh, has uh, basically box culverts and then one that's a clear span bridge. And those prices came in at uh, the clear span bridge at about just under $4 million and the concrete box culverts at about $3.5 million. So um, when we we got this information, we thought it was important to get that in front of council, obviously, and um, we're at a stage where we um, need to decide whether that, um, that estimated budget is something that council is comfortable with and moving forward and, and what we do with this project. There's some options. Um, obviously, we could uh, complete the designs and then wait and see if there's another opportunity for um, grant opportunities that maybe there's two thirds funding or 100% funding opportunities that will arise out there. Right now, the grant opportunity that's in front of you is only for a maximum of 750,000. So that would leave uh, the rest for city to pick up which again is that I think those numbers are, are higher than we had all anticipated so um, that's why we wanted to get it in front of council and have that discussion so if there's any questions from council at this point I can see if I can answer them for you thank you Kevin council Councillor Parzel so this question is to the finance officer uh, what's what's the uh, how much money have we set aside for this flood mitigation it's still available it could be applied to this capital project through your ship until the end of the year we're going to have 1.5 million on the flooding reserve thank you for the questions well uh, no questions just a comment i mean sure. we've got to deal with this flood issue uh, i don't see it as, a, as, a, as an option um, this particular recommendation in this report is for the 750,000. So I think we create, we're crazy not to apply for the grant. Um, and that moves us, if we did get the grants, according to my mathematics with next year's budget, if we make another 600,000, we, we would have the capacity to borrow if need be, I guess. But uh, to me, flooding, Sewage are two big issues that uh, we talk about quality of life. Well, yeah, quality of life is important, but my heart goes out to those people who every year they're, they're faced with flooding issues, and if we can mitigate them, I think that's a top priority for, I think, for Council. Thank you. Councillor Duvaco? I'll make a motion that report number. 20-199 from the Watershed Coordinator, UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund, 
for structural flood mitigation application be received. Further, that the Council of the City of Dawson Creek supports the submission of an application to the 2020 Structural Flood Mitigation Grant for the construction phase of 102nd Avenue crossing replacement based on the conceptual designs provided by Morrison Hirschfield Limited and agrees to provide overall grant management if approved for funding. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Parsloff, discussion? Um, go ahead, Councillor Dvekman. Uh, just a comment. I mean, this has plagued us for many years. It's, you know, we've got this far on the planning. I think we have to continue on and get the job done and there's uh, there's obviously money set aside some of it and uh, possible grant uh, grants available and um, you know I, I think we have to forge ahead and get it done thank you um, the two comments for me was obviously surprise in terms of the amount because I never uh, <laughs> I, and I was thinking back 10th Street Bridge I think was four million. Um, so it seems like unusual to me that uh, we completely rebuilt that bridge at 10th Street for four million and looking at this span there it doesn't seem to be uh, similar in although it's flowing in cost and and then the other side of it is to me is that that what's the best uh, option for us to consider moving forward in terms of do we put a clear span in there or do we put a box and in the long term is it better to put a clear span in there for that extra half a million dollars for the long term of ensuring you got that uh, clear uh, view so that piece of it I still have kind of that question about and the other piece to me is if we put forward this as it moves forward as it is with the $750,000 uh, to the Union to BC Municipality Community Preparedness, does that restrict us from the opportunity at other grants that may come available under the Canada Infrastructure uh, Program who are uh, have just announced $80 billion or whatever it was and through the federal and also the provincial government on some of that stuff. If we do this, does that restrict our options of applying for other grants that may come available that may give us 75 cent dollars towards a project or greater? So I put that to administration and I don't know if you can answer that or not. Yeah, so through your worship, on the grant application, I'm not sure. It was certainly something we, we can explore and see if that limits further opportunities. I think that's important. As you say, we'd, we'd hate to see uh, a two-thirds funding or something come up and, and not be able to apply on that. So that's maybe something we should we should check on. Um, the other two comments that you had is is the, the cost. And yes, it was um, it was a surprise to me as well. And we, we did ask some, some questions on exactly why those costs are up as much. Um, the cost of the clear span bridge, uh, albeit close to $4 million, the bridge itself is right around $1.9 million. It's the extra work with uh, the creek, uh, the channel, the cleaning, the riprap, a number of things that have to happen through that area that and uh, some utility work that increases the cost. So in comparison, uh, the 15th Street Bridge, uh, when we did it, I think was about one6 uh, we didn't have to do the utility work. We didn't have to do really any work with the creek. So that's, it is somewhat comparable. This is just a bit of a, it's, it's got a little bit more work beyond the bridge itself. Okay. As far as the options, uh, reading through the report and also talking with the contract uh, consultants, they definitely um, say that the clear span bridge is going to give us the best long-term results um, for flows and whatnot. So that's something that staff would definitely uh, feel that's money well spent um, long-term. And also I just wanted to remind council that um, this bridge uh, is designed for a 50 year event. Um, so it'll, it'll accommodate a 50 year flow without overtopping. Uh, the designs show that a 200 year event uh, should not overtop the bridge uh, and I say should not there's you know it's a design and there's calculations and stuff so there's always a chance that that uh, could be off a little bit but um, so they're saying right now even in a 200 year event it wouldn't cross the road but in an event like that 17th Street crossing will be underwater by probably a meter and a half at least and 
if that occurs, you're likely going to get water that's going to run south towards the intersection of 17th and 102nd. So there's still going to be significant flooding occurring in that area. And although this bridge may be dry, you're still going to have issues in other areas. And I just wanted Council to be very clear on that. Um, by installing this bridge is not going to solve all the flooding problems. It's just going to be another aspect of it. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so I, to me, I think what we've heard is that people are uh, 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 in, a, in support of the concept of uh, getting their uh, improvements done at 102nd Avenue. Um, and so that gives us, so then it's council's decision to agree on the design of what we want to move forward with for construction to begin in 2021. Um, it's this grant piece to me that I don't, I don't want to lock ourselves into something that may restrict us from something that we may qualify for through UB, through FCM or the British Columbia government on their infrastructure stuff. If we apply for that 750 at UBCM does, and then we're locked out of other potential funding that may be even more beneficial to us. And Councillor Parker? Well, I mean, that's a very valid point, but uh, if well, I think there's an understanding here that council, that staff's going to check on that. And it, I'm assuming if they find, yes, we are going to be shut out, they would report back and we can act accordingly, can we not? Or, or do you want an uh, amendment to stall this a little? Yeah, I just I was looking for administration's kind of thoughts or advice on that because the motion is that we're going to support, support the submission of the application to that 2020 structural flood mitigation. And I just I just don't know the answer to it, whether it might shut us out of other grant applications through that federal infrastructure program or the provincial one. And uh, I wouldn't want to shut ourselves out if we have an opportunity yet. Uh, and I don't know the answer to it, and I don't know if administration do. Blair? Your Worship, there are a couple of things. It's very clear that what we're hearing from Council is, look, the $750,000 grant is something we're interested in, but not at the expense of a greater grant. We yeah, can follow yeah. through on that. If there was a member of Council that wanted to move an amendment to reflect that to this motion, it wouldn't tie our hands to the seven hundred fifty. dollars uh, It would be we're going to pursue it if it doesn't impact uh, any other applications. On the other side of that, and we will follow through, just because I've never heard on these, just because you have applied, I'm not sure that it would exclude you no. if you accept it. But there are ways for the comfort of council if you wanted to amend the motion that said uh, to the effect that should it not hinder the opportunity for additional grants or greater amounts. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Councillor Earl? I'll, I'll make that amendment so uh, that uh, pending the confirmation from staff that applying for the $750,000 grant will not preclude us or prohibit us from applying for other grants that may offset more of the cost to our local taxpayer, uh, we move ahead as stated in the recommendation. Does that work for you? That works. Thank you. Second. Yeah. Awesome. Councillor Parzel, discussion? Councillor Duvakov? So this, this grant is pretty specific. It's the Community Emergency Preparedness Fund. Is that the fund that we will be applying for for uh, infrastructure? So I, I think my kind of uh, seeing the understanding of what the federal government or provincial government are doing in uh, economic recovery and uh, um, for Canada infrastructure stuff to try to spur the economy, they're, they're putting out a whole bunch of opportunities there and and they, they keep talking about shovel ready projects and all of that stuff but I just want to I don't I don't like like I said I don't know the answer to it and I just want to make sure that if if we apply for this one you, we want to look at some of that criteria on the other ones to make sure it just doesn't shut us out right so just a uh, clarification the infrastructure uh, grants will they be directed to the uh, emergency preparedness fund so through your worship I don't know but I, this particular grant was was something that was on the radar and and we knew it was coming before COVID and and like as the mayor indicated we now know that there is subsequent funding coming out as a bit of a spur for the economy and stuff so there'll be so I don't know if they'll be pushing it into the structural you know the flood mitigation or, or where that'll be coming or if it'll strictly be an infrastructure grant and separate to that but um, 
like you say, this this grant was was there, and we knew the deadlines prior to COVID coming. Do and do should and are you guys? Do you guys want us firmly in directing what uh, project you see us moving forward with, in order to get to begin this uh, now putting some meat on the bone of this project? So through your worship, if, if you wish, I mean, staff would recommend that uh, it's the clear span bridge. And uh, if, if council wants to solidify that in resolution, that would be fine. Okay. I, I guess I'm just thinking about, to, to me, the process. We need to lock into what it is council wants to see as a project. And how are we funding it? And, and be ready for springtime to get it going. And um, if we can give that direction of council, or if you would prefer to have more information go back, councilor director, I agree that we need to get it going for next year. Uh, to me, it's a priority. Um, you know, one of the main priorities here in the city, and um, like I wouldn't want to see it put into the budget based on getting the grant. Uh, even if we don't get the grant, the seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I think we still need to proceed with it, um, whether it's through borrowing or, you know, funding one way or another. Um, you know, the grant is obviously a bonus, but I, I sort of see the grant as, as being applied for under a, a special provisions, the, the emergency preparedness thing, which, you know, it's, it's a set, to me it's separate from infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure is sort of pretty generic. Um, you know, you can apply for many different things, but emergency preparedness applies to, uh, you know, applies to flooding and, and that type of thing that, you know, uh, the emergencies that we see around the province. So, but one way or another, I would just like to see the thing, you know, proceed. So, get it on the books, start planning, get the design. I agree that uh, the uh, clear span is well, the way we want to go. Um, it, to me, this is conceptual, so there may be some refinements that would reduce the costs. I mean, those are all things that you start looking at, you know, when you actually develop the uh, uh, engineered design. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a project that is, I think it's important to us. I agree. Councillor Earl? Uh, I'm of a mind with Councillor Javetkoff. I think, uh, unlike, you know, last year we pursued a grant for the event center parking lot and we were willing to, to spend some money to fix that up. But when the grant didn't pan out, we pulled the funding. I think this is one of those projects that needs to go ahead irrespective of whether or not there's a grant available given our experience with the last five, six years and the impact the flood issues have had not only on directly impacting people's lives, but on their peace of mind. Uh, it's, it's pretty awful to hear some of the stories. So uh, irrespective of whether or not we're able to get those grants, obviously we'd like to do this in a fashion that uh, is as cost effective as possible for our local taxpayers. But uh, either way, I think this is work that needs to proceed. And I think we've identified this as a council as a high priority item to deal with. So. Thank you. And if, there's, if the bridge uh, for an extra half million over the long term, and this is from all the information we've received from staff, going to be a long term issue, um, half a million dollars for uh, a stronger response, I think, is completely out of line. Thank you. So um, maybe if we can, then uh, if we can deal with the uh, amendment and the motion and then uh, after that if we could have a some direction to administration if we can give some direction on that clear span versus the box then that will help I think focus for the work they're going to do on it and that just keeps us moving that much further ahead if council are prepared to do that. Our administration is that? Whatever direction you so wish we will make okay good make occur. Thank you. So on the amendment uh, we have that uh, will ensure for uh, funding was the amendment uh, uh, additional that supplemental grant funding if I can shorten it up uh, all those in favor opposed carry and on the motion on the recommendation are you ready for the question as amended all in favor 
a postcard. And now on the uh, councillor prepared to on the uh, direction to administration on the preferred option for council to have administration <coughs> begin that work, the clear span versus the box. Uh, if you're prepared to uh, move that forward for some direction to administration, I guess I'm just thinking what, why we why wait for another month or two, Councillor Jovecka. Yeah, I'll make a motion that we uh, go with uh, clear span. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for that, Councillor Earl? And that, go ahead, Councillor Jovecka. You know the clear span. I mean, you can save a few dollars with the culverts, but you still got that problem with culverts. You know, permanent. We're replacing the culverts on 8th Street because there was an ongoing problem. We're putting in a clear span. Not we, but luckily it's the province that's doing it. Uh, so, you know, the clear span is the way to go. Thank you. Further discussion? I agree. I think, I think to me, if, if for the extra money, for the long-term value of uh, ensuring clear flow, uh, Enhanced, I think that's the best decision for us to move forward with and completely support it. Further discussion? You ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, Councillor Parson. Related to this, uh, we're, you know, I mean, I'm in full favor of what we've just done, but 17th Street, um, staff, you know, brought our attention to the fact that uh, 200 year flood. Uh, We'd still have problems. Um, where where would are we with trying to have a remediation for that part of this flooding issue? Kevin, well, go ahead. Kevin. So, through your worship, um, as I mentioned, yeah, during a 200-year event, what they're estimating is that 17th Street at that crossing would be probably about a meter and a half underwater. So. Um, in order to uh, bring the crossing up and get it out of the water, you got significant infrastructure and probably a significant span. So not exactly knowing how big that might be, you're, you're likely to spend, uh, again, similar type of money uh, as what we're looking at for 102nd here. And because of how the channel's um, shaped in that area, you're still going to get water to come up out of the channel and spread out into that floodplain. I st still believe you're going to have flooding in areas, even though a lot of that water is coming underneath that new structure. So you might spend, let's just say it's the same money, you might spend $4 million, but you still might have flooding. It might not change anything. Um, I think you could classify 17th Street Crossing as, you know, and if we have to close that once every few years, five years, uh, due to some overtopping, you might consider that to be nuisance and not, you know, impact um, access because there is ways around it. And especially if 102nd is done, um, you will have access around. So my suggestion would be that I think you'd spend a significant amount of money there to try and resolve a problem and may not be able to resolve it. And so that money might be better spent somewhere else. And my my thought would go to 17th Street South, maybe down by Willowbrook, those existing culvert crossings that overtop in events, that might be a, a, um, a location that we look at next before we look at 17th and 101. Thank you, Kevin. Go ahead. Related to this, um, <coughs> so you, you know, you, you're talking 200 year events. I thought the Fraser Basin study said 200 year events would be coming 15 year events or something like that. Uh, can so you uh, update me on that? Because it seems to be a moving target here. So, through your worship, the, the, the language they like to use nowadays is not, and I apologize for using it, is calling it a 50 year, 100 year, or 200 year, is actually annual exceedance probabilities. So, uh, a 100 year event is a 1% and a 200 years is a 0.5%. So what that means is um, every year you've got a 0.5% chance of this happening. Uh, because when you say it's a 200 year event, everybody believes, oh, we had one, we're good for 200 years. That's not actually the case. It's, it's the probability. So they're changing the, the terminology and changing it to annual exceedance probabilities and percentages. Can I suggest sure. that we use this uh, more modern approach if i can use that without any 
I'm not making any distortions against yeah. anybody here, but it seems to me, I understand that. It's the 200 year thing that, uh, you know, uh, bothers me, right? Yeah. And, and I have actually instructed our consultants and everybody to do that. I just, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm still stuck in that uh, still terminology. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Um, Thank you. Anything further? Thank you. Talk, uh, administration, you're good with? Fine. Good? You're worse. Awesome. Uh, our next item then is 7.2. We have report 2200 from the Watershed Coordination Coordinator regarding collaboration with Fraser Basin Council's application. Councilor Parzel. I move the report 2200 from the Watershed Coordinator in collaboration with the Fraser Basin Council's application to the Climate Action and Awareness Fund be received further that Council supports the fund in partnership with the Fraser <coughs> Basin Council. Further, the council supports the proposed activities and authorizes staff to participate. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Kemp, discussion? Well, it Councilor makes an eminent sense to me to work with our neighboring communities. Uh, we've, we've been doing that, and this just will continue that. Uh, the climate uh, crisis that uh, we are facing is not going to go away, and we are we have a duty to stay ahead with best practices as far as we can. I see this helping us. Thank you. Further discussion? Ready for the question, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. And uh, report 7.3, we have report 2193 from the Public Works Manager regarding our washed rock supply and delivery contract. Councillor Javetkoff. Move that report number 20-193 from the Public Works Manager re request for quotations 2020-45 washed rock supply and delivery be received further that council award RFQ 2020-45 washed rock supply and delivery to Nels Ostro Limited for a two-year term for the amount of $40.15 per ton plus applicable taxes. Thank you. Second, Councilor Kemp. Discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Seven point four, we have report twenty one nine five from the city planner regarding a develop development variance permit twenty oh nine for nineteen twenty four hundred and second army. Councillor Parzal. I move the report 2195 from the City Planner Redevelopment Variance Permit 20-09, Cheryl Smith. For 1924 102nd Avenue be received. Further, that development permit 20 09 vary in the following sections of zoning bylaw number 4450 2020 be approved. Section 15.15.1D to allow for the existing detached suite to be located 220 meters from a fire hydrant. Section 5.15.1F to allow for an 8.08 meet a maximum height of the existing building containing the detached suite, section 15.151 GI, to allow for all portions of the existing detached suite to be located 10.06 meters from the rear parcel line, section 515.1 G2, or two eyes, that's two, isn't it? Yes. So, to allow for all portions of the detached suite to be located 2.06 meters from the single detached dwelling on the parcel, section 15.13.2a, to allow for a total combined floor area for accessory buildings of 95.05 meters squared, section 6.10.1, to allow gravel access into the detached garage and Table 5, by reducing the parking requirements for a parcel containing a single detached dwelling and a one-bedroom detached suite from three spaces to zero spaces. That Thank was you. a big motion. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Do I was I thinking halfway through that maybe uh, I would wake Councillor Javatkoff <laughs> up and he could read the other half. <laughs> Do you have a seconder for the motion, <laughs> Councillor Kemp? Discussion? <laughs> Councillor Parslow? Just uh, one question about the last bullet, Table 5. 
uh, reducing uh, the parking requirements from three to zero. I find that unusual. Uh, can we have some <coughs> verbal explanation for that? Nick? Yes, Nick is here. so um, technically speaking, um, the parking requirements um, must meet the minimum um, parking stall size on a residential property. Um, so basically the garage currently is about three meters from the property line. So you cannot technically have a parking space that's only three meters long. So because of that, there are no official parking spaces on the property. There's no separate driveway for people to park cars. Um, depending how long the car is, it can sort of fit in the boulevard. You know, it's a dirt road in front of it. So, um, and potentially to park in the garage as well, though we don't count that as a designated parking spot either. So they, currently there doesn't appear to be a, an issue with the parking there. Um, it's just under the zoning bylaw, technically we have to count it as zero spaces. Process. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Javakov? So was this the builder not aware that uh, they require a building permit or what happened there like there doesn't seem to be anything right with this house so three worship um, I'll defer to Nick and the only reason I'll do that is because I do have a bit of a conflict with this property through a personal relationship so I'd rather not comment on that thanks Ken. Yes, uh, in terms of um, the permits that um, staff have found for this particular um, garage. There was a building permit issued in 2005 and an occupancy permit issued in 2007. Um, again, there was um, documents indicating that it was to be attached to the house, which was a requirement of the zoning bylaw at the time. Um, unfortunately, we don't know exactly what happened. We don't know why the permits were issued um, as they were uh, for a detached garage. Um, you know, it is it is a permitted use currently, um, and the permits were issued in the past. We don't, unfortunately, know all of the history. Clerk? No, I was just going to say, just a, a key point here, this goes back to the mid-2000s. This is now trying to bring it into compliance, as I understand. So um, it's very unique. This is not a new construction that has just been dealt with in the city, and somebody missed it. Uh, somebody missed something 15 years ago here at the city. Councilor Director? I guess my only concern is that if, uh, if we can't confirm that they uh, conform to the... Uh, building code then we should be looking at putting a notice on the title the same as we did for the one we dealt with at the last meeting like I don't you know I don't know what the circumstances were but you know if there was a building permit issued and the building inspector confirmed that they complied with the building code I guess that's a different issue but uh, if we can't confirm that then we should be considering a notice on the title. We approved the building permit with the um, understanding that it was going to be attached to the residence. It was built detached. We gave them the building permit and we gave them the occupancy permit uh, based on that error in 2005. Yes, the Three Worship. Um, um, what I was told was that. The original plan was for the garage to be attached, and then apparently it was later changed and approved as a detached garage. Um, as far as the building code, um, I don't believe there were any violations in the building code. It was mainly just um, contraventions of the zoning bylaw at the time. Okay. Further discussion? You ready? Go ahead, Councilor Parcel. Going back to party. <laughs> uh, Nate's language, uh, I believe, and I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong, uh, was that you don't believe that there are any parking issues currently. Um, is 
so that says that uh, there cr there's a possibility of there being some parking issues. Just depends on what the size of the vehicle, how um, many trailers they have. Uh, um, I would say basically um, it's hard to define the boulevard on, on that street. So 20th Street, that where the garage is located off of, um, it's currently unpaved. There's no <coughs> defined boulevard. Um, you know, there's, there's hardly any traffic on that street. I believe it's the only driveway access currently. Um, there are some lots um, further at the back that are kind of vacant residential lots. So basically, if, if the area was to be developed in the future, if those were to be developed, if the road was to be paved, um, you know, then there may be issues with parking vehicles in front of the garage or on the street. But um, as it sits, it's, it's the only house that really uses that road so but isn't the whole point of us having all these zoning things it's so that we have orderly future development I mean yes, I, I why, why do we have them uh, so we this isn't the wild west sort of thing right uh, you stake a claim uh, isn't the whole point of zoning things is that we have some certainty for people who are buying lots in areas and that we are going to have uh, it regulated so that it, it is fair for people in a particular area of town to know what could be put there yes I, I would I would certainly agree with that um, um, I mean there, there is a, a possibility that um, I mean you know council could could um, you know not if you grant the parking variance, it could be that they may be required to build a driveway in the future. They currently don't have a, a separate driveway, which I find a bit, a bit odd. Again, we don't know all of the history of this property, why um, there wasn't a separate driveway on it. For example, it seems to have worked for them um, up till this point uh, with no complaints. So um, really it is, yeah, I mean, there could be could be things in the future, how far in the future, we don't know. Um, we certainly wouldn't, um, you know, make these kind of variances for anything new. Um, we wouldn't recommend that, but it really is, is council's decision if, if um, you know, they want you to grant this based on the, the specific situation of this problem. Claire? Just following up on what Nick was saying, so the motion presently would exclude them from providing uh, off-street parking in that sense from what's moved here. So Councillor Parslow's concern, um, and it will be up to Council, this again is an issue that's being uh, cleared up from 15 years ago uh, virtually. Uh, whatever took place then took place. Uh, if Councils would so wish to require the parking spaces, as Nick indicated, uh, the motion uh, could potentially be altered to say everything is approved except this, which would mean then, as I understand it, Nick, the development of an off-street parking within that lot. Yeah. We have the motion. Any further discussion, comments? You ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Oppose Councillor Javekov and Councillor Parzel. Uh, item 7.5. We have report number 2196 from the Chief Financial Officer regarding our consolidated actual budget variance report for September 30th. Kim? I'll move the recommendation that report number 20-196 from the Chief Financial Officer regarding consultation act actual to budget variance report September 30th, 2020 be received for information. Thank you. We have a seconder. Councillor Earl, all in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Um, 7.6, we have report number 2194 from the corporate officer regarding the 2020 by-election. <coughs> Councillor Kemp? I'll move the report number 20-194 from the corporate officer regarding 2020 by-election results be received for information. Thank you. Second, Councillor Earl. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, all those in favor? <laughs> Opposed? Carried. I want to take the opportunity uh, as a result of uh, our by-election and uh, our newly elected councillor filling the sixth seat is Darcy Dober and Darcy's in the, uh, deli um, the gallery today and so we want to uh, give a special welcome to Darcy and uh, congratulations on your election to council. We're excited that uh, you're going to be joining us and thank you for coming today and we look forward to uh, two weeks when you get sworn in and you'll take your chair at City Council and we want to welcome you on behalf of uh, residents and council. We look forward to you joining us. Thank you. Um, 7.7, .7, we have a memo from the corporate officer regarding the November 9, 2020 regularly scheduled meeting. Councillor Javekov. I move that the uh, November 9th regular meeting of council begin at 10 a.m. to accommodate the inaugural meeting at 9 a.m. Thank you. Second, Councillor Kemp. Discussion? And that will be for uh, the swearing in for Darcy? Yes. Councillor Earl? Oh, oh sorry. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, bylaws, we have nothing. Um, do you want to take a five minute break now and then we'll get into uh, the conclusion of our agenda? A brief update on a couple of uh, items. I participated in um, a downtown business walk and kind of helped organize by Fran from Community Futures. and. So I spent about three hours last week walking downtown, started 102nd Avenue, worked my way down the street and met with each uh, business owner or representative. And honestly, it was so interesting to hear the feedback um, from the business owners. Uh, and very, very positive in terms of seeing the uh, return to business for uh, a, good, a good number of them in terms of they've had very, very positive years. I was really encouraged Natasha from Vintage, who's uh, seven years in business, and she said it's been a record year for her in terms of her business. She's seen really strong uh, support and response from out-of-town shoppers, people from Fort St. John and Grand Prairie. She said upwards of 70 or 80 percent, and I heard that consistently from three or four of the business owners. Um, but um, overall, I was just really encouraged to have that discussion with them, and for some who really struggled and closed for two months during COVID, and. Uh, are now on the um, road back and the one thing they did mention was how strong uh, they were hearing from people about the shop local, support local uh, message about local people coming in and supporting them and and the there was another interesting comment in there was people from out of town really really appreciate the uniqueness of those boutique type retail shops that we have downtown and they really love to be able to walk our downtown uh, core to all of the various individual uh, small retail boutique shops that are down there and then uh, go out for lunch at uh, a number of our restaurants. So it w I was really encouraged by it and I'm going to schedule three or four more of them and make sure that I go and get down through as many of them as I can. Uh, I Organized, there was an or, or a meeting organized by the Chamber of Commerce, a Zoom meeting where I gave a community update, and it was a similar update to what I provided to the Rotary Club about a month ago. And it was just really an update on uh, the strategic priorities of council, the objectives. We've been two years now in this term of council, and so I thought it was a really good opportunity to give an update on the work of council and what we've been uh, doing and accomplishing and still have ahead of us, and um, uh, operational capital. Uh, initiatives uh, work that's ongoing and um, it was uh, really well uh, attended and appreciated the opportunity to be able to give that update. Blair and I went up to Fort St. John last week and we spent an hour and a half for two hours with Lori, uh, Mayor Ackerman and uh, the new CAO in Fort St. John, Milo McDonald and Milo is a familiar name for us who was our staff sergeant of the RCMP here six seven years ago and has made the transition as into a, a chief administrative officer where he w was in Williams Lake and now has moved into Fort St. John and assumed the role of the retired uh, CAO in Fort St. John, the long-term CAO, Diane Hunter. And so we spent a couple hours with Laurie and Milo and uh, really had a great discussion and really good, just casual uh, conversation about a whole bunch of things that we uh, work on uh, in common. And the purpose of the trip up for Blair and I was to really tour the 
splash park and it's just a little bit more of this uh, kind of work around understanding what's available what's people are doing for concepts of their parks and um, really enjoyed seeing the Fort St. John uh, Centennial Park, the Splash Park, the work that they're doing and uh, their winter cities uh, strategy that they've adopted and so I think it's been uh, really worthwhile and valuable and I'm really excited about kind of continuing to push this work forward and uh, on our uh, park uh, and the redevelopment of Rotary Park and what that uh, begins to look like. Uh, Westjet made the announcement uh, last week or the week before they're pushing back the launch again from November 5th to January 4th I think and certainly frustrating uh, to see the impacts of the travel industry in the world today of COVID and understandable but frustrating and uh, the worry about how um, the travel industry is being impacted by COVID and across not only North America but the world and you're seeing major major impacts. I read an article of Prince George Airport figure there are three to five years of digging out of this uh, issue and uh, YVR put a, on hold a uh, already under construction parking project at their airport and and uh, putting the brakes on them so we're not alone in terms of this our frustration is getting this service launched and underway and so we will continue to work. I reached out to WestJet and Pacific Postal and it's a delay again for them. It's certainly not a cancellation of the service, they're just a delay. So, Councillor Parzal? Uh, can I ask some questions? Absolutely, about? sorry, yeah, okay. anytime. Uh, well, let's just deal with this uh, WestJet. My esteemed colleague, uh, Councillor Jabatkov, made a, a very wise statement uh, to me that uh, I think is important. You know, we want this WestJet business to be a success. Whilst there's all this COVID going on and people are not flying so much, we don't want it to start and then stop. Right. So maybe, whilst I concur with what you said, it might be a, a good that they are doing this so that when it does start, it's going to be robust and it's something that the community can rely on. Because as you said, which is a big part of, uh, if we're going to have passenger services here, if a route to Calgary, a direct route to Calgary, will mean that people here can connect, go to Vancouver, and the total time in travel, if you put in car and so on, is, this is your point, it was, it's going to be the same as, uh, as if they'd uh, driven to uh, Fort St. John. Very similar. It, yeah. it looked like in those connections. Right. Now the tour of the Fort St. John Splash Park, it's flow through, isn't it? Yes. Did they, did you get a, a, an estimate, or not an estimate from them, it should be the actual cost of operation and how much water is used? Because that would be very interesting to the Mile Zero Park Society. We did not get a, a t actual cost based on the water. You didn't flow get through. an operating cost at all. Certainly, no, not on that, Milo. We're getting together again to follow up on a number of uh, points in our discussion, so we can check on that. I think honestly, right now, uh, it's just really about this idea of what's what are people incorporating into their plans and designs for amenities of parks, and uh, is it a just a water park splash park do you incorporate a 12 month of the year park do you want to have winter activities do you want to so it was it's kind of that right now it's just plowing some ground we're not getting into too much of those details about operating okay well no I, thank you but I, I just know that's one yeah. big topic uh, to bear in mind float flute through saves a lot of hassles with northern health and you know all that related stuff yeah, that'll be that kind of scope out once you get your planning. I think the committee's organized and we put some meat, start to put it together that you start to analyze that on operating costs and what are the amenities you're putting into it and all of those things, right? It's, right now it's just council's direction was look at the redevelopment of it and look at, start to scope the ideas out and that's what we're doing. Um, 9.2, so I've been doing some more work on the childcare project uh, that I started and it's really about that is trying to um, reach out and understand what the needs are. We hosted a meeting, uh, child care uh, action plan meeting with the users of uh, the providers of child care in the community and 
Um, there, it was very, very informative and helpful in terms of understanding what the needs are and what the issues are. And, um, and I've reached out to the Minister of Health, uh, or the Minister of Children, and I got their response included on the agenda. And so the big issue, I think, in first off is understanding, getting that needs analysis done, getting the data to understand what are the needs in our community of childcare, uh, infant, after school, set, uh, all of those different aspects. And so what I got to try to do is now is to get some funding to start and begin that process of doing that da data analysis. And UBCM had some funding available. I know the District of Chetwin accessed that and are doing that uh, childcare study. Uh, there isn't anything right now that's available that can help us do that, but what I do want to do is request if Council will give us the support is I need to uh, put some um, funding aside to get some additional staff time or get some uh, help uh, to be able to start to scope it out a little bit and help me with the development of the overall initiative and whether that comes through our economic development uh, funding or other uh, areas within admin to be able to help get some support for me to be able to do this. And then I really got to try and find some money and funding to be able to do the uh, child care uh, study to begin that uh, moving it forward. And so that's what we're asked for today. Brenda or Blair, can you kind of give me a th thought on the funding internally for support? Well, we've made alterations to the economic development budget for 2021 upcoming. Uh, I would have to sit down with our chief financial officer to see what is available this year. I believe there there may be dollars still in the economic development fund uh, that could be accessed to do what you're talking about. Yeah, I'm not talking about a whole bunch of work right now, just to try to start to scope out some of that uh, work alongside. And it just I don't have the capacity to kind of do it on my own. So, Council Partner. Well, I understand that. Um, do you have any idea of dollars in that? Uh, <laughs> not at this point. I guess I just I, I'm going to continue to work on it, and perhaps what we'll do is we'll look at the various aspects under. There isn't any urgency to this right now because I got to. There's a, it's the funding as well for the uh, to do that grant funding for the data, but uh, we'll bring it back to the next uh, council meeting and understand where there's some envelope of funding available and start to get an understanding of kind of what we're looking at for the rest of this year for three or four months of support work on it. I just wanted to bring council up to date on kind of what I'm doing. Councilor Dubeckon? I'm uh, just curious, is there training for daycare workers at our college? Yeah, it's called, it's called the ECE program. It's the Early Child care educator it's a two-year program and they and once they get that they they can then become a licensed daycare there's an 18 or 20 hour program that's also available for somebody who's going to be uh, operate a home daycare okay. so that's the kind of the two different models in order to get the subsidy from the provincial government to operate a licensed child care facility like our uh, the Kiwanis or the Calvin Kirk Performing Arts Center, the child care there, or there's uh, the campus care kids at the college. There's, a f I think there's three or four of them that are actually licensed. They get the subsidy from the province for that. But you have to have ECE, early childhood educator, uh, train people to work in them to in order to qualify for the subsidy, my understanding. Um, but here's the thing, I, I've heard it so many times now from folks about um, child care and how important it is to uh, health care to business to everybody is talking about how we need to get people uh, to be able to have uh, you know we went out for dinner Vern and I one night and we were talking to one of the ladies at the restaurant and she said that my biggest dilemma right now is child care I got my mom living with me for a month to look after my little guy from 5 till 10 I need child care well I can't get it right so it's a big deal it's a big issue bigger than I kind of ever really appreciated and <clears throat> so I think uh, for all of the folks that have children appreciate how big a deal it is and so I think there's some opportunities and we're just got to go to work to try to help find a way to support it for our community <clears throat> um, next we had Jeremy sorry you had a question I was just gonna with respect to the um, child care needs assessment um, and I presume that's kind of the first step we're looking at here is, are there any <coughs> larger organizations that can help uh, us putting that together? Is that something we are 
are strictly have to do with human health. So like just as far as even with a template or some sort of guidance, and I assume there's some sort of organization trying to create a standardized needs assessment for communities that work in close calls with the child care providers. And that's some of that work I just haven't had the ability to do, but I know I I did get, grab a copy of the survey that Chetwin, as an example, are doing for their community, and they had hired a consultant out of Edmonton who's put that survey together for their child care needs survey for uh, the district of Chetwin. And I think that's what first we got to do in order to start to grab that support of uh, building child care. We just got to understand the needs for it. And I don't understand it well enough at this point to s answer that, but <clears throat> we um, that's why I need some support, need some help. Um, yes, Brenda? Um, I'm thinking just a motion from council if, if they're in favor of the project. Um, and then <coughs> at that point, if council's in favor of it, then we can move forward with either looking for staff time. Okay. To put towards that, we're looking externally to find um, someone that could do that needs assessment for us. So support the uh, initiative in principle and we'll bring back any implications to us operationally or financially. Councilor, Councilor Earl, Councilor Kemp, discussion, Councilor Parzal. You know, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, why is it that the, somebody, I mean, we talked about entrepreneurs and business people, why is somebody, if there's all this need out there, why isn't somebody stepping forward to run a new business? I mean, I just, I'm not, so I'm not speaking against no. anything, it's just, what's, why is it that, uh, the, the, there's this need. Somebody, the city is doing something that you would have thought a an entrepreneurial society would would jump into. So know? there's uh, there's um, lack of facilities. Um, there's lack of support. There's issues around high demand infants that need more one-on-one -on -one care. So it's a variety of a shortage of qualified staff um, and underfunding. And part of it is people who take the ECE program, get finished after two years, and they make $20 an hour, so they're just not staying in it. So, Councilor Earl? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can echo some of these sentiments. I mean, a big, big thing is the difference between an infant and a toddler and how uh, a daycare is allowed, how much staffing they have to provide for infants versus toddlers is it reduces the number of children they can make, or children they can have on site. But the amount they'd have to charge to make up that difference is significant. So, uh, I mean, if you've got if you've got an infant trying to find uh, childcare space for them is, you know, like finding a, a Sasquatch riding a unicorn. It's just not easy. There's no. Uh, and, and as his worship said, is one of those jobs where people get into it because they're passionate about it, not because there's a lot of money. Aid, but at the end of the day, uh, if you're investing two years of your life in the skill set, uh, you do expect to be compensated to a certain level. But you know how much can your average working family afford to pay so that they can keep working? At a certain point, it just makes more sense to have a spouse stay home uh, than you know essentially work for free or for benefits. So, and the challenge. Uh, the issue to me when I we started, well, this door opened a little bit, was on the uh, hospital health care workers and the RNs and all of that, where it's a, it's a huge issue for us in building health care. And if child care is an impact to that, then we need to go to work on it. I, I, I've been amazed. There, I, was, I think there's four or five licensed facilities. I think there was upwards of probably eight or ten <coughs> home daycare services. So there is a... There is a large number of them, far more than I ever realized or appreciated. Um, but the need is even bigger in terms of it's just the diversity of the need. So anyway, that's where I think we go to work on it. So, so the average, uh, and I, it's my time at the hospital foundation, we average, you know, two to three hundred children born in Dawson Creek every year. Um, and for the first three to five years of their lives, if they are come from a, a family that has fewer than their Require child care, and each daycare can have three to five kids per child care provider. Yeah, uh, the variance we had from Doss Creek Vet Clinic where they're putting in that facility right next door to be able to establish a daycare for their uh, professionals that they're attracting because they just 
it's such a big need for it. it it's like I say, it's just been really interesting to get into it, and I think there's a way for us to help build the economic uh, uh, opportunities that are in our community for a wide variety of workers. So, thank you for that. Uh, did I vote? No. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, thank you, Brendan. <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, 9.3, we had a couple of delegation requests and so the first one is the Dawson Creek Minor Hockey Association and the uh, figure skaters and so at this time I uh, am going to move a motion that uh, we direct administration to um, bring back a report for our next meeting on the options of getting a second ice facility for the community and I'll speak to it after. Uh, bring back the operational issues around COVID and all of those other things operationally that we need to consider to open it, as well as for council the financial consideration. So if I can get a second or I'll speak to Councillor Kemp. Uh, I think we need to look at a second facility, obviously um, from a whole bunch of perspectives that I believe are important to our community. Um, and we have, we, we commissioned a report three years ago, biggest delegation we ever had in this room in my seven years was when we were considering are we going to put the new uh, compressors, chillers, and mechanical equipment back in the arenas and the curling rink by the demand. We commissioned a study. Uh, we had a thousand ice users uh, in the city at that time. I think it's still uh, very uh, evident, uh, the strong demand for it. Um, I don't know what the demands will be for uh, operationally and around COVID, and maybe it might be better for us to consider the Encanta Event Center versus the Ken Arena for dressing rooms and spatial requirements and all of that stuff. And I think that's where we should have administration bring that information back to us so council can consider the uh, issue and uh, deal with it at our very next uh, board meeting. And ask that from that perspective, of uh, the council support the motion. Councilor Earl. Your Worship, and I do apologize earlier this morning I missed those delegations because I had a prior commitment that I was, able to, was unable to get out of. Uh, one thing I would also um, hope to see in any report that comes back to us from staff is um, what the extent to which there is an ice time shortfall. I understand from the user groups uh, they're not finding it sufficient. I know. Uh, I don't think our intention in not opening up a second sheet of ice was to deny anyone access. It was more a matter of we did not think at the time the demand would be there given that games at that time, I think we were in phase two, were going to be an option and it was going to be largely a skills development year. <coughs> so I would like to know just what the shortfall's been at between the actual bookings and what people have tried to book, I guess, um, to give us, you know, how 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 short or what is the distance between the supply and demand. But uh, no, I, I fully support seeing the report and hopefully getting the issue. Thank you, Councillor Kemp. I just wanted to clarify that will include the Kin Arena as well as the Encanta Event Center. Yeah, I think the two options are: do we put it back? Just I think the assumption was we just move to uh, consider the Kin Arena, and I think because of COVID and dressing rooms and all of that stuff, we don't know what that means. I would like us to consider either the Encanta Event Center or co uh, the Kin Arena as an option, based on those requirements for cleaning the dressing rooms and having the spatial requirements required so I, I just want to have the option of us considering it i wouldn't want to direct the staff to bring back a report to put the ice in the kin arena and find out we've got to have it closed every second hour because of dressing room spatial issues around COVID. so that's why i thought if we get the both uh facilities considered in the request perfect I, that's what i was hoping was both yeah. so councillor parcel i'm also interested in knowing what other communities have been doing with their ice arenas I did know, but it's been some time since I, I had that information. I'm talking northern communities. How many of them have actually closed arenas, or have they reopened them? I'm thinking, you know, I'm familiar with what happened in Prince George and Terrace. They lost track of Smithers and Grinnell. Other, just so we know what's going, going on, because this COVID thing is uh, maybe this my pessimistic nature, but I think it's long term, it's not short term. So yeah, just just know what's going on. I am I'm, I'm surprised though at the small number that was cited. 
am I missing something here? Because you guys are more familiar with the hockey scene than I am. But I seem to recall a figure of 600 people actively involved in ice hockey. When, uh, I, I forget his first name, uh, Johnson. When, you know that guy from Cal... Brian Johnson. Brian Johnson. And uh, he gave a framework for fee structure and stuff. And he did a survey, and I'm sure there were 600, and yet mm -hmm. the gentleman who, who came here uh, taught to use the figure two, it had dropped from 290 last year to 250. Our, our Minor Hockey Association, and I go back 35 years or 40 years, has always been around 250 to 300 oh, kids and okay. registered in minor hockey over that time frame of my, and I know Laverne was a register of minor hockey yeah. for 10 or 15 years, so it's been pretty consistent. I think Fort St. John would run around four, 450, 500. Grand Prairie's about 1,000. Um, so we've been really that's, consistent. That's minor hockey, right? Am minor get, hockey. Am I getting confused with people using the, the ice for, for hockey? Yes. All ages? Yeah. I was going to say that okay. would be the juniors, the seniors, uh, the men's league, rec leagues, and so on. Okay. So, all right. There's a hundred old timers. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Some past that time. <laughs> Blair? Your Worship, just maybe there seems to be some confusion in the um, population out there noted in the letter we received as well as things I've heard from some parents thinking that the Kin Arena was closed due to financial reasons to uh, for maintenance issues or a new pad needs to be put in before when in fact that is not the case. Council made the decision based on the issue we were facing as a, a country, really a world with the pandemic, how do we make it work? So. Just if there's anything I could clear up on that, I note that the figure skating letter uh, quoted it. I've heard it from a number of people involved in minor hockey parents saying, hey, is there something wrong? When in fact, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. So just for clarity for to try and clear that up. Good point. I've heard that rumor as well. People saying, well, we got to do a major capital. Well, when we put the three and a half million into the mechanical, it was also we had to do the pads eventually, the concrete pads and the curtain rig's been done and the memorial and the kin arena are part of that planning for the future, but that's not the reason that they weren't open. Further discussion? Ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you for that. And the Dawson Creek Dog Park, and so um, we, we, Council's decision to put the dog park at Newby Park was primarily not that we didn't want them in Barbary, it was being used by other groups and I think the ball was still kind of little league and there was still the disc golf and so that was my recollection of why we preferred Newby Park as an option but now today as a result of the uh, delegation and some of that feedback that from residents and stuff um, we need to say are we going to consider a temporary use again and two is that the location that council would prefer to have them in or would you like to consider uh, the move to another location? Councillor Pars. Well, I'd like to make a motion that we extend the the agreement with the Dark Park Group for twelve a further twelve months, and that we receive a report from staff after cons consultation with the Frisbee Golf Group about the pluses and minuses of, mo of relocating from Newby to Barbary. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? For a second time, do I have a seconder? And do I have a seconder for a third time? Okay. Councillor <laughs> Earl? I just have a question. Um, so Council Parcel's point about extending it for a year, I was under the impression that our initial motion uh, allowed a two-year timeline horizon for them to have that temporary park there. So I don't know. Uh, no, it's up. We had uh, addressed that in the delegation, Jeremy. It was, it was one yeah, year. It was, it was expired the end of September. Okay. Um, so we do their their lease, their agreement that we've given them for that temporary use at Newby Park is expired the end of September. Extension, and it was I think the I think the dog parker making that request to move as a result of some of the feedback that they had saw and had received. So, Councillor Javekpa? 
I'll try another motion <laughs> that we <laughs> <Charlie> uh, seconds. <laughs> <laughs> that we approve the uh, moving the dog park to to Barbary. Um, I don't know when the agreement is up or whatever, but if we get a seconder, I'll speak to that. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for the motion that we extend the uh, term and move it to Barbary? Offer to move it to Barbary. Councillor Earl seconds. Thank you. Councillor Javeka. So. My recollection of the reason that we didn't put it in Barbary is because there was, uh, you know, ball games and stuff going on in there. And to be honest, I like I don't drive down that road every day, but I have never seen a ball game going on in there. And I just wondered from uh, administration if there is a organized ball in that ball diamond or. Thank you, through your worship. Um, I also don't believe, for COVID reasons, there was no ball, but I don't believe they were using, minor ball has been using that park much either in the last couple of years. Uh, disc golf has certainly got a dugout set up in there, and they use a bit of the area. Yeah, so disc golf, I mean, they're, they're using the whole park, and I, you know, the use, use in Barbary is very uh, minimal, and, and it can be accommodated according to the ladies that were here. But... Um, you know, with the feedback that we've got at Newby, it just seems to me like it's going to be a lot less impact to move it to Barbary. You know, you've got the school over there, and you've got a big uh, park, and the parking is a long ways from the from the dog park. Um, there's just so many negatives compared to Barbary. Uh, I think moving it to Barbary is positive and uh, you know it's obvious that uh, the people involved with it are you know passionate about looking after it and it's kind of disappointing that the SPCA has you know kind of discounted their area I mean part of giving them that large area was for you know future dog park uh, and I think that's another topic but for the immediate uh, time, I think Barbary is a better alternative. Oh, thank you. Councillor Parzal? Well, one of our guiding principles is to involve people who are affected by our, potentially affected by our decisions. My resolution was that we were going to consult with the disc golf people who are a very viable group. It's uh, fun to see them before we make any decisions. We may well end up at Barbary, but let's talk to them and understand the implications to them before we just suddenly made a decision. Process is important. I'm all for a dog park. Barbary might be the best location, but let's talk to people affected by that before we actually enact it. Councillor Jovecco. Yeah, I think, you know, we've we already talked to the disc golf people before, so we, we know what, what they're uh, input was to me if we make a decision now there's still some time this year to to move if you wait for another month uh, it changes the whole picture as far as moving this fall thank you so Blair oh Paul, uh, sorry Ross thank you for your worship um, the Gossamer gets our group did come before council um, when council was first considering this, this decision. They were not in favor of sharing that area. There were some concerns about species, dogs, uh, intermingling, what have you there. So just a point. Thank you, Ross. Councillor Earl? I do also recall one or two letters from residents expressing concern with the dog park in Barbary's proximity to 15th Street and how busy an artery it was and the dog escaped and ran it. It, it seemed, um, I don't know to say far-fetched, but it seemed unlikely to me at the time, but we did receive that feedback. Just as well. Thank you. <coughs> Further discussion? I think we did receive a letter as well from the high school that they use that baseball diamond. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. well. So the... Um, Every every uh, every option when you try to consider a temporary use facility for uh, this has got its pros and its cons, and certainly the uh, two we wrestled with with Barbary and Newby was exactly that. The feedback we got from Barbary and um, 
and the concerns about Nubia. Now that we've they've operated it for a year, um, I think the aspect of moving it forward. I, I and I really give these folks credit because I've followed them along and they are working, they are volunteering, they are m m cutting the grass, they are looking after it. So I give them a ton of credit for the work that they've done and they've tried to build a, an amenity that's been very popular in our community and I think we continue to work with them to do that. But uh, so Earl and then Councilor Parzal. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do think Barbary has all, just because of how much more centrally located it is, has always been a better natural location for something like this. Um, so I'm, I mean, I'm willing to support moving to Barbary, um, whether we take it back to the other stakeholder groups for, for more input. I'm never opposed to hearing from people and they certainly have contact information, but I think um, I'm happy to have it back at Barbary. Thank you. Councillor Parzal? No more comments. Thank you. Further discussion? So the motion is that we direct uh, staff that we will engage with the Dawson Creek Dog Park to facilitate moving the temporary dog park to Barbary and uh, extend that a uh, temporary use for another year for a term. All those, are you ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Councilor Parcel opposed. Um, and the last item for me is the I received a proposal from Donna at Peace FM and she had sent me a note and said that for they'd like to start doing a weekly update um, from mayor and council and a uh, couple minutes on the radio once a week for a hundred dollars uh, for the month twenty five dollars per week and um, I kind of like the idea of it I think the more you find ways to communicate and update the community on what you're doing it's uh, positive and um, so I wanted to bring it forward for council for consideration and I'm prepared to make it um, and make the time to commit to doing it on a regular basis and or councillor interest as well. Councillor Earl? Um, so I seem to recall when I first uh, assumed office here once or twice going into the local CJDC radio station and doing an update uh, alongside Councillor Wilbur once or twice. I'm not sure if that was discontinued or they thought I did. Yeah, they were doing a lot of stuff with us on that sustainability, on that sustainability message and it was a weekly update then. Okay. That's, and so that. Uh, we scuttled that aspect. Yeah. Okay. So I would like council's approval to proceed with this for uh, six months or a year and we'll see how it unfolds. Councillor Kemp, move, make the motion that we proceed with it. Thank you. Councillor Jackoff, you second. Councillor Earl. Um, just one comment. Since this is <coughs> essentially advertising, the city is buying. Um, do we have any obligation to reach out to the other radio people in the region to see if they can, if they want to put, I don't know, a bid or what, it, what you want to call it, or is this? I guess Chet is uh, technically a nonprofit, so maybe there's a distinction there. But I just want to make sure in advance doing an end run around our competitive bid process. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, they came to us, approached us with the concept, and I didn't take it out to CJDC to see if they were also interested in wanting us to do something, but if they do, I'm happy to bring it back to council as well. For the, Blair? Your Worship, just clarification. So there are two requests under the Peace FM. It is the one is the interview at $25 per week. Uh, the other is two mentions, if I see that. That's the optional. Uh, just for clarification, what is the motion entail? Mm -hmm. I was going with just the $25 per week for the $100 a month. I'll do the interview and people okay. will tune into it or not. I hadn't thought about seeing the value and yeah. promoting it. Does, oh, it does seem curious to pay an additional twenty-five dollars a week to promote an interview, our own interview, on the radio that we're paying to do the interview. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it I was an concur. optional piece, so that's why I didn't bring it forward. <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, so that's it for our mayor's business. I think Brenda. Uh, Chief Administrative Officer, operational update. Nothing, uh, Your Worship, that we haven't covered already. Okay, thank you. Consent calendar, we have a couple of items. Uh, if I can have a motion to uh, approve. Councillor Kemp? 
Councilor Javakov. Anything anybody would like to lift or discuss from the consent? Uh, I did. They, we did get the um, letter from the Deputy Solicitor General on the intersection safety cameras, and I did uh, note that Wayne Plannert gave an update on the Lepke Park improvements. And there's another example of community residents, group of neighbors getting together and doing an improvement. And really appreciate that they got that work done. And kudos to them, and kudos to Wayne for organizing. It. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Strategic priorities. Nothing new at this time, Your Worship. Media. Uh, so we'll move to Committee of the Whole, and uh, we'll 15-1. We have the Staff Sergeant. Is Brian here? Sergeant Hermandic? He is. We'll just get him. Anybody who carries a gun gets to go first. <laughs> it's a rule. Licensed. Good morning, Brian. We just were saying how it's uh, always good to have somebody here that's armed. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Good morning. It's good to have you here today. Yes, well, Staff Sergeant Warren, I have to travel down to the Lower Main. That's why I'm in in a spot today. Okay. So good morning, welcome back. Um, this report covers a period from the last four months, I guess from June, June 1st to September 30th, 2020. We'll start off with resources. Uh, surplus to establishment, we have one extra body here as a result of uh, pre planning for an outgoing transfer. Uh, right now we have five soft vacancies with no hard vacancies and we have one new recruit requested from depot we're during this pandemic depot was shut down so it'll take some time before we get a new recruit uh crime trends for the period of january 1st to september 30th uh the rcmp here in Dawson creek received 6216 calls for service uh, the total call for service is down 15% compared to the previous year. Specifically, uh, within the city, are down 16%, and rural down 13%. 70% of the calls for service were within the city, or 22% were in the rural. This is relatively static; it doesn't doesn't change much. Uh, post crimes are showing a downward trend contributing to an overall decrease in our, our calls for service. Uh, the largest decrease over the period of June 1st to September 30th have been seen in the areas of break and enter team residents down by 63%. Uh, break and enter team business down 69%. Vehicle thefts were down 48%. And just uh, thefts were down 36%. There was a considerable increase in personal crimes, notably a 67% uh, increase in sexual assaults compared to the same period. I just want to clarify that four of those were uh, historical sexual assaults. So uh, the oldest having occurred 13 years ago when the victim came forward. Um, property crime continues to be the largest uh, driver of calls for service. However, it no longer accounts for over 50% of the calls received. The property crime will continue to be a priority for us. However, some initiatives relating to the person's crime will likely be identified as a policing priority for next year. And our uh, annual policing plan priorities are EPP. So we selected organized crime repeat and chronic offenders as one objective. That's to identify, target, monitor, and address a minimum of 10 repeat chronic offenders in the Dawson Creek area before March 30th of 2021. Uh, so to date, uh, chronic offenders have been identified and are being addressed as quickly as, they're, as they are identified. Uh, the list of targeted offenders is ever changing and modified as offenders come and go. 
As example, recently uh, an offender tied up our emergency lines by calling 911 over 300 times in a single weekend. Several hours. Uh, and the response plan was initiated and the offender located, arrested, where he remains in custody. Number two was uh, property theft. Our objective was to reduce theft under 5,000 in the Gossin Creek by 10% before March 30th, 2021. Uh, multiple proactive media releases have gone out, encouraging community members to walk up and, and decrease risk of becoming a victim of property crime. Business cards are currently being created to educate the community on the telltale signs of fraud to assist them in avoiding becoming a victim. <coughs> broader identity theft. I'm sure many of you have gotten a phone call from the CRA. Uh, <laughs> number three, substance abuse drugs. So objective is to identify, target, monitor, and address max a minimum of 10 drug houses or buildings being used to sell illicit drugs in the Dawson Creek area. Um, since January 1st, um, over 20 search warrants and or production orders have been completed targeting CDSA related offenses in the Dawson Creek area. Multiple illegal firearms and hundreds of grams of cocaine, heroin, and fentanyl have been seized as a result of the proactive work. Provincially recognized prolific offender involved in tra trafficking illicit drugs in the Dawson Creek area was arrested and remains in custody. Um, Cross-training opportunities are being developed within the detachment for all officers to enhance their CDS-related knowledge and enforcement. <coughs> and number four, police, community relations, and police visibility. As the pandemic, we considerably cut our, our community events. However, um, we wanted to get a minimum of 15 community events within this year. Uh, two members of the Dawson Creek Detachment part participated in the Cops for Cancer fight run. They did it on their own. Um, one officer volunteers as a liaison to the Nowatin Friendship Center. And the detachment provides a member to sit on the community mental health committee. Uh, Personally, I've just been speaking with the schools here in town, and they are allowing us back into the schools to do talks and whatnot with precautions. That's it. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present this report to you today. Any questions? Thank you, Brian. Questions? Councilor Earl? Um, I have a question, and I'm not sure if it would perhaps better be posed to the SPCA, but you're hearing they're not, so I'm going to bother you. Um, there was a <coughs> fairly well-publicized incident about a month ago uh, where a woman in our community was attacked quite severely outside the 7-Eleven by a, a dog, and the person who owned the dog is, is well-known, and she reached out to me last week as uh, the, the dog has yet to be removed from the owner and uh, she hasn't had any update on her file and she's quite upset obviously so I'm not sure if you can pass that along please but um, it's obviously a very traumatic experience for her and I'm not sure who to go to her. I, 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 know, I know which, uh, what you're talking about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Parcel. ODS, what does that stand for? The context is for on long term ODS. Off duty sick. Sick, not injured. That's. Encompass encompasses injuries. injury. Okay. It could be a minor injury where they're not a roadable resource. Right. So there's a couple that are in um, in the office working. However, oh, they they are not signed off. So the three members operating on light duties would include some of those on ODS. That's correct. 
Councilor uh, Kemp? I, I'm not sure if um, I should wait till Damon gets back or not, but a few council meetings before we had talked about cameras and and it was thought to be deferred to the RCMP to see the input on if cameras would benefit in our community. Are you able to comment at all or should I wait till Damon gets back? Cameras. Like cameras, security cameras, yeah. Um, so Damon uh, was going to speak to that today, oh, okay. but because he wasn't able to come, uh, Brian's going to do the report, and Damon will report oh, that okay, information perfect. back sorry. to us, Councillor, on their next uh, committee of the whole. Oh, meeting. sorry, I didn't mean to jump nope, that. No sorry. problem. No. Thank you. Anything further for Sergeant Brian, uh, Councillor Parcel? The person that phoned three hundred times um, is the charge. Uh, uh, is it a nuisance charge, or, or what would the charge be for that? Exactly. I mischief. Mischief. Yeah, yeah public, uh, public mischief. Something under the okay. Mental Health Act? Mental Health Act. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it was. I know they did hours of work just to negotiate, you know, speaking with senior management in the North District. Yeah. A lot of okay. time. <laughs> yeah. Great, yeah. hey, thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian. Appreciate you coming in this morning. And, uh, Great work. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, report, 15-2, we have a report from our airport manager. Good morning, Rowan. Hello, everyone. Welcome. All right, so hello, hello again. It's nice to see everybody. So uh, my first, uh, we do the whole report, so <laughs> see how this goes. Um, so uh, the biggest thing for the airport most recent, uh, our most recent update is that the WestJet link service has been delayed again, this time to January 5th. So uh, everything at the airport is still good to go. Everything has been installed in their office. It's just a matter of them starting up their operations. And unfortunately, given the the, uh, the state of aviation across the globe, actually, it's, it's this is a, a huge surprise. It's unfortunate, but it's not unexpected. And uh, you know, as we continue into this uh, pandemic, we will have to be flexible with WestJet and see how um, the rest of 2021 will actually play out. And then um, for Sealand, they're actually extending their operations to December, which is good. You know, um, that's a completely new business for our airport, is actually having a flight school on site. So we're excited to, to have it the rest of this year. And potentially, uh, we're working with them to provide the lease rates for next year. So it's a possibility that they might move their operation to Dawson Creek, which is, you know, that's excellent for our airport, and we'll keep working with them to see how they want to uh, the rest of this year and potentially in 2021. Um, and uh, the DIS vehicle. So, um, given the large capital expense of that DIS vehicle, we've just deferred that to 2021. Um, uh, we were successful last year in doing a short term lease from Mag Arrow in Edmonton, and I've been advised that, you know, that's how we are going forward with this winter season. So um, it all played out very well last year, so we're just going to continue forward with this upcoming winter season and reevaluate uh, how much of a capital item the DSV will be in uh, the next budget year for 2021. And um, for operational updates, uh, last Friday we had a bird strike, not unexpected for this type of year. Um, you know, no damage was sustained to the aircraft. They were able to land safely and depart back to Vancouver after the mechanic had to look over their, their aircraft. So, um, just a small uh, operational update. Uh, this was reported to Transport Canada for no standard operations and no, I don't expect any long term uh, corrective actions from this. It was just a, a standard thing for this type of year. Um, yeah, and then uh, one of the bigger updates we got from NAV Canada is that they they had an announcement in September that they were continuing a workforce reduction. For us, that could potentially mean that they're going to reduce their level of service for our airport. So maybe reducing their hours of operation. Um, and just for your uh, information, uh, they're not a 24-hour operation at Dawson Creek to start with. So it's not going to be a massive um, impact on safety. The guard is a portion of the day where they're not in operation. It's just that that portion may be expanded as they reduce their workforce. Um, a thing that might play um, in our favor is that we've had increased movements from Sealand. So as they do their circuits and touch and goes, it's actually boosting our numbers for movements per month. That does play in our favor, but ultimately with the way that uh, aviation is 
this current state, I imagine that we will see some type of reduction in hours that they're operating at Dawson Creek, but I don't think we're anywhere near where some airports that are talking about pulling up completely and offering no remote advisory service. I, I don't think we're in that situation. They might, I think the most likely outcome from this is that they'll reduce their hours of operation. And then, uh, is there any questions for me? I'll take questions for you guys. Thank you, Rowan. Uh, any comments or questions? Deep, go ahead, Councillor Jamakov. So, with the reduction of uh, Nav Canada's uh, schedule, how does that affect Medivacs? Well, um, so, like currently, the Nav Canada, they're, they're, they're providing remote advisory services for 16 hours out of the day. Ultimately, um, given our traffic, I don't think that they'll pull up completely, but I do think we'll see a reduction in hours, maybe to 12 hours or 9 hours, somewhere around there. Uh, we, we do have a follow-up meeting with them to discuss what exactly that will mean, how much they're looking to reduce, and that's a meeting that they have to have with every airport that they're looking at doing a reduction of service. Mm -hmm. uh, for medevacs, I, I don't think that it would have a massive impact. Like The majority of the medevacs that we see come by during daytime, uh, and I don't think that will be when that Canada is looking to reduce their service. They, they want to stay at the airport for when the majority of the traffic is happening. It's maybe in the very, very early hours of the morning or in the very late afternoon where they look to cut back their level of service. But, but ultimately, pilots, like medevacs, come in and out 24 hours a day. Like if, it's, if the patient needs to be moved, that aircraft will be departing. Uh, what happens when that Canada isn't out of service is those aircraft just do uh, traffic advisories. Um, it'll be more on them to you know, refresh the, the latest weather conditions, but ultimately, I, I don't know that. That Canada would put the airport in a situation where if they were to pull back their service, uh, safety would have an impact. So I, I don't think that the medevac situation, like as long as we're open and clearing the runway, which is what we would normally do this time of year, there's no reduction on our, our part. So um, the level of service that we do to the airport, like there's uh, the runway will still be cleared as long as the runway is cleared. And, the most recent weather update is out, the medevac will come in. Thank you. Um, any further questions, comments? The um, the uh, flight school is um, increasing uh, that daily traffic fairly significantly. Yeah, absolutely. You'll see you see a massive spike when they're operating because it really does power numbers because really what they're practicing is taking off the landings and they'll just in and out all day. So it really does pattern numbers a bit. It does play in our favor, but at the same time, those numbers are during our regular operating hours. So really the NAV Canada reduction, it might be from what I predict, if they'll pull back in the later afternoon. So like I think right now they're operating maybe right up until I like, think maybe 9 or 10 p.m. And really realistically, this time of year, not a whole lot of traffic is really departing or arriving at that time. So I imagine that's probably when we'll see they'll pull back those sides. But during our prime operating hours, I, I don't think they would reduce those. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Councillor Parzel. Two questions. One, one's to administration. So why, uh, what caused you to um, delay the purchase that was budgeted for? Uh, when it was put out to tender, there were no responses uh, to it. Uh, it was the airport manager prior to Rowan's arrival uh, had then reached out to some providers. Uh, it became an issue of timing, and had we or were we able to proceed at this point, we wouldn't have received it until next year. So we needed to secure a de-icing unit uh, yeah. to ensure the safety of the airport. Second question uh, relates back to uh, Paul's uh, comment about the med medivacs. And here I'm just seeking my, making sure that my understanding is, is correct. These, the airport at Dawson Creek has a truck equipped with, uh, um, unless it's all electronic equipment that measures the icing conditions, the moisture conditions of the runway, and c calculates the, the stopping distance and things like that. 
that information is made available, is it not, to the medic vet pilots? Uh, yeah, and, and sometimes, so so we have in our, our, our work trucks, um, it, measure, it measures the friction of the runway. Friction, and that's then, right. Yeah, the friction of the runway. Yeah. And uh, the other information that we gather is what type of contaminants on the runway, so there's dry snow, wet snow, um, right. things like that, snow, dry snow trace. Um, that is very, very important information for pilots, and our hours of operation haven't been reduced, so it's work very much on our side where we continue as we did last year. Um, and pilots, no matter what time they come in, there's always something on the call. And our cell phones are close to public. So it's a matter of just calling us and saying, hey, we, if it's 2 or 3 in the morning, we're still available for somebody to come up to the airports, get in the work truck, go onto the runway, and actually do the most recent uh, friction update. Um, that's always an option. So really, that's high quality information that's important to pilots that is available still going to be available no matter what in Canada. Yeah, because when we close at night, there's that big gap of when nobody was at the airport. Like, you can refresh the weather information and see maybe, you can kind of guesstimate how much the weather might have changed the runway, but as a safety net, some pilots will always call the airport and say, we'll pay for the call for somebody to come out and actually do the eyes on the ground, what does the runway, what is the condition sure. right now, and if needed, they'll clean it for a bit before they arrive, but that, that option has always been available for anybody that needs to ask Thank you, Ron. Uh, anything further? Thank you. Okay. Great job. So Great job Thanks, on your Committee of the Whole report. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> nice um, uh, 15.3, we have a report from our corporate officer. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Why, thank you very much. Nice to have you here. Well, nice That's to be here. Say that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, this is sort of a dance you guys do every yeah. day. <laughs> she see what she, she see how she treats me during the normal day. <laughs> For now, I'll just go over uh, my report. Just say something different sometimes. <laughs> Throw him off his stride. Yeah, I'll, I'll work on that for now. <laughs> um, I'll begin with the records management project. Um, it was started this fall and administration staff have been trained on the new system. Tanya Stettel has been hired on a term contract and she'll take the lead role with implementing the new file system within the corporate admin department and then she'll assist with the transition with all the other city departments. Um, the by-election is now complete and I want to also congratulate Councillor-elect Darcy Dober um, and we really look forward to seeing you on council. Uh, the by-election had the lowest turnout, unfortunately, from any records that I have on file, um, but that was expected due to COVID. And um, we did provide mail ballot voting for all voters in hopes that that would increase turnout. Um, the mail ballot votes did make up about 10% of the total votes. So that might be something that we, we could consider in future elections. Um, we're, we have uh, the inaugural session scheduled for November 9th and we have a council orientation session for October 29th for Councillor Elect Ober and if any other councillors want to attend as a refresher, you're more than welcome to attend. See if he gets the same story the rest of you do. Gotta <laughs> <laughs> keep on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Chamberlain Park encroachment project is nearing completion. Uh, the land sales for the 10 properties uh, will be completed once all the signatures are received on the subdivision consolidation plan. That's taking a bit of time. And most of the encroachments have been removed. And I uh, will provide a final report for the end of the year on that. The last thing I want to comment on is the community awards. They're currently open for nominations. Uh, the categories are Youth of the Year, Entrepreneur of the Year, Business of the Year, Citizen of the Year, and Inclusive Workplace of the Year. So nominations are open until November 9th, and then the voting will take place for three weeks after that. Um, you can find more information on the city's website. One thing I did want to mention is that the council policy currently in invites winners to council in December, and that would bring another five attendees into council chambers so I'm wondering if council is interested in just having uh, the mayor announce the winners over Facebook live if that might be an alternative and if so I could bring that forward to the next meeting to bury the policy for this year 
probably be better to do it that way and then we don't put uh, because there's no way we're going to get them all be able to all accommodate them and we could have them come in one at a time and then exactly and then come in one at a time after when the winners are announced and so sure would you prefer to, to continue with inviting them in no or i think we do a facebook button. live and okay. then invite winners in to get their award maybe after okay so we announce them and then we could okay yeah and that way they get to come into council and okay i think we can continue with the policy then sure okay and that's all i had to highlight unless there's any questions thank you brenda councillor parcel just going to the uh, grant writers section mm -hmm. What's the uh, grant application for if it's the last one submitted to PRRD 30,000? That I'm not aware of, but I can find out and get back to you. Okay. The Northeast Foundation, is that the same group that Jeremy's involved with? Is that right? The Dawson Creek Rotary Club Walking Trail. Is that the one, Jeremy, you're involved with that? The Northeast Regional Community Foundation. Yeah, is that the same thing? The Northeast Foundation is it the same thing as? I the believe the Northeast Foundation is the new name for. For the community. <coughs> Remember the one you were. Yes, yes, yes. I'm aware of it. I'm not sure if that's the one being referenced in this one. Uh, okay. The Northeast Foundation, but uh, that's not the exact name, but it could very well be. No, I'm just confused uh, by it, this one. You're okay. just confused as to what. Is that a, is that a, a group that I'm not aware of, or is it the same group that it is called the Northeast Community? Okay. Again, I'll look into that one and I'll get back to you on that as well. Thank you, Brenda. Anything further? Thank you, Brenda. Your, your Worship, just oh, sorry. Uh, I'll take a moment just to say thank you to Brenda and your staff and the volunteers for the by-election. Uh, I heard numerous uh, compliments about how it was handled. Uh, people coming in and getting out in a manner that was conducive to the times we find ourselves in. So I just wanted to express a thank you to you and uh, everybody that helped on that. So, all right. You're welcome. I had a lot of great staff there that, that right. really worked hard to make sure it was safe for everyone. Thank you. Uh, yeah, good point, Blair. Thank you for that. Um, our next uh, report, 15-4, we have our Chief Financial Officer here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for having me here. Um, I think, uh, just to, to clarify, these reports from July to September, not May to June, as is showing the agenda. Um, the I think the key things I wanted to discuss here is the um, regarding to the collection of property tax. Uh, we have the most updated number is around 96.2 percent. This is really a great percentage of collection. Uh, the portion remaining is still between residential and business. The rest is 100 percent collected out the other classes. So that's really a good news. Um, we are currently working, finalizing the draft one um, budget for 2021. We collected all the information from the managers. I want to really think it was a, a long process, early than usual, but uh, the whole team was very cooperative in, in bringing the numbers and um, we are now finalizing and it'll be presenting on November 23rd taking out in consideration now the discussions we had in the strategic meetings and uh, series of them that we discussed uh, during June and July. So, and uh, just uh, last week we had the auditors here uh, starting the 2020 audit, the interim audit, and uh, so far, so far so good. Uh, <laughs> we will be receiving the updated report next month and presenting COSA. Oh. And that's it. Good. Thank you, Fabi. And so, and I did meet with uh, Jaron, the external auditor, and, uh, and during the audit. And certainly, we look forward to the auditor and the audit being completed. And and I and I, I made a point with uh, Jaron, and I certainly want to emphasize it with council. This is council's appointment of an external auditor. It is the request of council as the policy governance body, saying we need to have an external audit to ensure that the financial statements accurately represent the 
statements provided by our staff and it's council's opportunity to have that uh, report presented in front of them and so I, I think that's the message that we uh, this is a council's report that's being driven by and on behalf of uh, the organization for our fiduciary duty on those financial statements so uh, I look forward to them coming and giving the report and council having the opportunity to meet with them and have those questions. Councillor Parzal. The 2020 property tax collection, um, that, that is surprising, surprisingly good. How many folios is that for class one and class six? In folios? You know, how many individual, did individuals uh, still have outstanding? Or how many businesses is that? I, I don't know by heart now, but we can get this information. Just, just uh, specifically, kind yeah. of curious. I mean, I think we should reflect on this a little bit because you know there was great concern in the initial adjustments to the COVID crisis that, uh, and there was a number of actions taken by the city. Um, some related to adjustments of dates which were permissive, permissible. Um, I'm just wondering if the, what lessons we might learn uh, from the pattern or if we if in fact find out what do we do next year? Do, do we repeat? Is that going to be a, uh, another option allowed by the ministry? Is it something we want to do? If we, can we get some feedback from those people who are affected? How did this help them with their with their emergency situation? Or maybe it's a different year. It, it's no short-term thing. You've known that COVID is going to be with you and we don't do it. But I just think we, it needs to be a discussion point sometime in our budget preparation. Uh, so that we give plenty of advance warning. I mean, a lot of the, my friends in the business community, whilst they're concerned sometimes about the business taxes, but they also like predictability. So what can we expect? So if we can give that out, what we're going to do, from the point of view of dates, that might be a useful, especially for those who are struggling in, in their planning. But I think that's... So again, I'm always interested in other communities. Do we know anything about other communities? Um, how do we stack up in that? I mean, this is, I mean, I'm saying this, uh, we were thinking, boy, what was it? Would we be lucky if we got 70, 80%? Or is that an unfair statement on my behalf? I, I know we were very concerned. Uh, through your worship, yes, there is a, a lot of uh, organizations now collecting the data through surveys about different municipalities and comparing the collection. But uh, the last time when I saw that was about two, three weeks ago, and in discussions with other CFOs, it's fluctuating between 70 to 95 percent. Uh, and normally those that uh, rely heavily in a uh, major industry, like in the in the lumber business, are, these are the ones that are uh, struggling uh, on the collection. They may come to the payment by the end of the, the year. Uh, so those that have heavily in residential, they got collections uh, pretty fully, uh, reached the full capacity. So it all depends on, on the location and what kind of uh, um, class A on the property tax is uh, the major, major item. And I've forgotten what class sits is. Is that the, is that the farm? Class six. What is the It's the business. It's uh, our business. The commercial. Yeah. Commercial, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Flavi. Um, thank you. And next we have the report from our general manager of community services. Good morning. Good morning, Your Worship. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Pleased to be here. Good to have you here. <laughs> oh, God. Um. <laughs> well, she could be sensitive for that. That's too... <laughs> Don't you As council is aware, in, in March of this year, we closed, uh, I guess, all of our facilities, our lease facilities in the community. And I just want to indicate uh, and stress enough how good and amazing job our staff have done in stick handling 
not only the directives of uh, provincial health organizations and uh, health governing bodies, but the the pressure from our user groups uh, council received a couple letters this morning that uh, would indicate there is a fair amount of uh, stress out there and demand to get us back into those buildings. So staff have done a pretty amazing job. They have sat in on, I'm not sure how many calls, um, with the BC Recreation and Parks Association, who has been instrumental in informing the province on ongoing development and opening a facility to those operational guidelines, which seem to change sometimes um, even throughout the course of a day, but uh, failing that at least week by week. Um, COVID has impacted our capital plan this year in that we spent two or three months working from home and we struggled a little bit with finding contractors to do some of our work. Um, put a lot of stress, or not a lot of stress, but uh, put a lot of additional time on staff and user groups in developing um, safety plans, safety plans for our own facility, safety plans for uh, Dawson Creek minor hockey operations, for example. And finally, something we're starting to see uh, a little bit more of in a number of different facilities are, are, are increasing an anxiety levels. We are seeing staff members who are becoming more and more anxious about you know, being in the public, operating facilities, you know, what protocols are in place, those sorts of things. So certainly COVID has been, uh, I'll say, interesting for us this year. Um, we were able to this summer to actually host a number of summer programs. Um, I believe we had about eight different camps hosted. Uh, Shantae had in indicated we actually were successful in, in bringing out 12 of those programs this, this summer. Uh, we were able to open the sports fields, gradually open them in July, and Slow Pitch was able to um, operate uh, through a modified uh, a modified program, no people in the bleachers as an example. Um, the Ken Bork Aquatic Center and the Memorial Arena uh, opened in September of this year. Um, I really do believe we are doing the best job to put as many people into those facilities as humanly possible right now. Um, the pool, uh, I believe two weekends ago, we are starting to change our operations and again our staff have been able to shift on the fly, enable, in this in the case of the pool, enable uh, greater use of our change room. So you've probably seen significant commentary from the general public about how we are operating. The reality is we can not operate or we can operate under our provincial guidelines. And again, I think we're doing a pretty good job of, of doing that. Um, we continue to maintain a great partnership with School District 59 and continue to operate our after school sport an art initiative. This is our second year in partnership with the school district and that's turned out to be a very, very great uh, partnership. Um, with the loss of O'Brien School, we were able to work with School District 59 to bring a number of our programs into the school district and again we've got a great relationship with the district to be able to do that. Although I had some information this morning that would suggest that in our changing environment the district is already starting to uh, Claw back some of the outside use of the, of the facility, so I'll follow up a little bit more on that to find out where we're at with that. Um, but it's been a great relationship. A um, couple of higher level things: we have submitted our our uh, grant application through Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program um, to replace the Memorial Arena slab. Uh, Mayor talked about that a little bit earlier today. It's part of a, a long term commitment to improving our facilities. Um, we did meet, I think we somebody mentioned earlier, we did meet with the grant writer to explore future grant opportunities and we've identified a number of items on our 2021 capital plan that are now on the radar and I did see this morning how we're going to have more ongoing meetings with our grant writer to explore uh, opportunities on a more timely basis. Um, staff have been working with staff at the Encana Event Center to improve and work on the public good and pleased to announce this morning that we're actually starting to offer some of our own programs in the Encana Event Center 
and we'll also uh, we anticipate reopening the Wayne and Bev Dolan walking track for November second yeah. next week. So we're continuously working with the Encana to um, be able to get more folks into that facility. Um, we have been working with Spectre also to renegotiate uh, the final couple of years of our tourism agreement. Part of that agreement sees the, has seen the Alaska Highway close. It's been closed for a number of weeks now. We've been working with the Mile Zero uh, Park Society to move uh, the contents of Alaska Highway House down to that facility. Um, I guess of note, uh, my probably my biggest priority, or one of my biggest priorities at the, at the moment is working with our leasees to uh, renegotiate new lease agreements and reflect the commitment to reducing our budgets going forward. Most of the groups, well, all of the groups now have at least had verbal conversations and we're just working on fine-tuning those agreements as we speak. And I don't really have much to report on this morning, but there were some interesting conversations coming forth from Engage Sport North on Prince George. There's some interest in some future development here in town, so some good stuff potentially yeah. coming out of that area as well. So yeah. I'll leave it out there this morning, but happy to answer any other. Thank you, Ross. Uh, uh, questions, comments for Ross? Councilor Parzal? I'm pleased to hear about the walking track. Uh, quite a few people have been asking me ab about that. So do you envisage that the operation will be as it was? In other words, people checking at the swimming pool? Uh, or are you going to have some advanced booking like we have for swimming? How do you see it operating? Yes, I believe it'll be much the same as what we're doing at the, at the pool where you will register in advance. Uh, we have to coordinate with the programs taking place at the swimming pool. Uh, so we're kind of alternating between uh, that front desk staff, uh, depending on what program or activity is going on. There will be likely reduced hours on that walking track versus historical years just to balance that. Good. So, so just on the same, so is you say open November the 2nd, so you're getting information out this week about how people will access it? Yes, I believe that information is out right now on our Facebook and, and uh, website. Some of the information has gone to also to the public health just to confirm that, so that information is a little delayed, but we will we are getting information out as soon as we can. Okay. One last go ahead. Uh, the under the strategic priorities, uh, may I make a suggestion that the opening paragraph be updated? That one is May the thirteenth, two thousand nineteen. Council has. Revise that. Uh, yes, the worship. Thank you. Yes, we will revise that. Yeah. Thank you. Anything further for Ross? Thank you, Ross. I uh, got a call from uh, Senior um, Mrs. Simmons, and she was the sweetest, sweetest, uh, asking about the walking track, and she extended to me that she understands how difficult it is, so they'd even be willing to pay. But her and her friend. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing if the walking track was open. So if that wasn't happening, I was going to have you call Mrs. Simmons because she was the sweetest lady and <laughs> <laughs> the mayor wouldn't be able to say no to her. <laughs> so that's great news. I appreciate you guys uh, getting that updated. Thank you. And uh, our next item, 15-6, we have a report from our general manager of development services. Good morning, Kevin. on a few things out of the report. Uh, I guess we'll start with uh, this morning, the snow. Um, it's kind of the first real snow that we're getting and sticking on the ground. And so uh, the latest reports I had from the here just uh, recently was it's now turned to rain. So things are going to be a little slick out there. Temperatures look like they're supposed to remain warm, but the pavements might still be cold because we've had such uh, below normal temperatures, so people need to be aware of that um, this might be freezing the pavement. So we've got a couple sand trucks out, we've got track lists out on sidewalks, and we'll respond as we need to as we move through the day, and we'll have some people in later if necessary to just kind of keep it set up, cleaned up. And then the next couple days, we'll be warm, so I suspect most of it will melt away 
which is good. Uh, but his first few screen calls are always the trick ones because there's no additional salt and additional sand out there. So again, just uh, remind me that is right. To take her easy for that first little bit. Um, update on some of the capital projects of, of interest. Um, 15th Street project uh, is essentially complete. We had some deficiencies on the storm sewer project that was part of the overall that runs on 97th Avenue and uh, the contractor had to do some uh, repairs for deficiencies and unfortunately by doing that, uh, that appears to have kind of closed our window on, on getting that paved um, unless there is a uh, the paving plant is still operating but we'll see what happens. Um, we'll do the best we can to try to manage that as we as we go through the project. Um, overall, that project went uh, exceptionally well. A um, few little hiccups to start with, and then we had you know, a significant amount of rain, but overall the project uh, went quite well. Um, the other one is uh, the 10th Street sewer project in behind the hospital. Um, that project is complete, although the road is um, was essentially tore up throughout the construction process. And so what we've done, rather than trying to patch something that just wouldn't have um, held up, is we put some actual buildings on the road, graded it, tried to make it as good a road surface as we could throughout the winter. And um, I've included that project for next year to go in and completely redo the road, reconstruct, excavate, new uh, sidewalk, the whole works. So, um, this best for the uh, residents patients in that area. We'll, we'll, again, we'll manage that as best we can and, and maintain it. Um, also working with Blair on developing a bit of a four or five year paving plan as we talked about potentially council looking at some increased paving levels over the next few years. So um, we kind of like master plans and pavement assessments and trying to work through that and, and with an idea that we'll bring back to council probably in the too distant future to uh, shed some light on that and let you know what we're thinking and if there's any thoughts from the council or not, we'll talk back. Uh, just a quick update on recycling. Um, we, we had an update from uh, DC Recycling. So last Two weeks ago, during the recycling, uh, we didn't have auditors out, as I understand. Um, I heard after the fact that the auditors, uh, those particular group of auditors were done, and that there would be a new group starting, and I think they are starting possibly this week. Um, but during that week that they weren't there, of course, we didn't have anybody up there with the ability to identify or turn containers around if they're contaminated or anything like that. So the work for DC Recycling is that contamination spiked. So that week, um, apparently they had a lot of food, which again, I'm not sure why people believe that that's recyclable, but it's not. Um, so again, um, they saw a significant increase in contamination. As we said. Um, it appears that as long as we've got the auditors out there and they're either educating or um, turning cans around, that you know, on the processing end, they have a, a better go of it. But if we don't, it seems people just want to revert back to the what they do. Uh, water treatment plant manager, we've got a new manager up there. Some of you may have had an opportunity to meet her, Nicole Renella. Uh, she's taken over for Devin Arrow. Devin's moved to Public Works. Um, so Nicole started, I believe it was in September. Um, and goes by. Um, anyways, really pleased to have her. Um, we had gone through uh, a process process with her actually in the spring and then COVID, there was a number of things that happened and, and uh, long story short she wasn't able to start it until September but we're, we're pleased to have um, We had a request to council earlier in the year from Ridge and Norman Trucking about some topsoil um, out at one of our reservoir sites. Council at that point directed staff to develop an RFP and go through a process to solicit anybody interested in that. Before we did that we actually had um, Neil Norman, go out and just check the, the material to see if it was viable before we even 
point out there, it, it turns out that um, it wasn't topsoil or it was a mix of topsoil and clay. And at the end of the day, it wasn't material that was uh, of interest to, to uh, Reginald Trucking and likely anybody else. So, um, as that was the most item I didn't want to follow up with, I just wanted to let council know that we've, we've essentially scratched that off as, as uh, it turned out not to be working. Uh, the last meeting, uh, Councilor Barzo asked for a bit of an update on lead mitigation. Um, we chatted a fair bit about the 102nd Avenue crossing, which of course is a big component of the overall flood mitigation strategy. Uh, I also wanted to touch on some of the work that KWL is doing for us on the sanitary side of things. So I've been working with them uh, since we initiated. They've come to us with some conceptual um, plans and strategies on dealing with some of the sanitary backups. And I don't want to get into too many details, just again, because it's still at the concept stage, but essentially what they're looking at is in some of our uh, problematic areas is looking at uh, pressure systems. So kind of similar to what we did at the Chamberlain, where we would drain to a specific lift station, and then that lift station would pump to uh, downstream and, and what that does is by having a, a lift station and a mechanical basically um, barrier is it protects that neighborhood that's served by the lift station sewage can't back up into that area so it would uh, protect that one area and then pump downstream and, and so right now we're looking at that we're also looking at I need them to make sure that there's no downstream effects because um, we don't want to move the problem if we're trying to solve one um, so we're looking at that in a couple areas. Um, of note, the 8th Street lift station that's going in as part of the bridge crossing project, um, that will essentially protect um, the 105th, the 106th, the 107th, just off 8th Street where we had some problems. Because again, essentially, those areas drained 8th. 8th will drain to the lift station. And then that lift station will pump under the creek and over to the trunk main that's on 110th. And the issue that's happening right now um, is 110th trunk main is full or fairly full. And as the flow comes down 8th Street, it simply just, it can't get into that trunk fast enough. So then it backs up onto 105, 106, 107. So again, that lift station going in is going to provide that barrier and that level of protection. So that's good news. So that's why we're looking at some similar type systems in some other areas. Can I interject with a question? Go ahead. Yep. Yes. Appreciate what you what you're saying there. Uh, but one question that jumps to mind, it's based again on something you said uh, some time ago, with the flooding, uh, we didn't. Luckily, we didn't have a power outage at the same time. So, are these pump stations? Do they have backup power? Yeah, three years. But absolutely, that's um, a must that we have. That especially, um, we're going to have it on any anything moving forward. But especially the one on Eighth Street because that's a. Uh, it's not our main trunk, but it's uh, you know it's it's one of our major uh, conveyances of uh, sewer, so it, they'll have emergency backup power. So in case of power loss, um, another component that's again it's it's kind of like beating a dead horse, but um, KWL has highlighted again that obviously our biggest issue is inflow and infiltration. So that's rainwater getting into the system. So any opportunities that we have to remove, disconnect, eliminate that from getting into the system is only going to help us. So again, we've we've made a change in the bylaws in 2012 to not allow uh, perimeter drains, weeping tiles to tie into the sanitary system. So that's good news um, for those newer homes, but we still have a large contingent of properties in town that connect. And so uh, they've just again highlighted that any any opportunity that we have to try and eliminate that or reduce it will help us in the long run. Um, they've looked at a lot of weather patterns and, and and why we saw this, you know, the the extent of and the severity of the the backups we did this year. Because again, um, although the rainfalls were significant, they weren't the levels of. 2016 or, or things like that but as we dig into it you definitely see patterns it we knew that it was a wet spring we got high groundwater levels and so those are all playing parts into the that inflow and infiltration that as soon as we get you know 
a significant rainfall, it's putting that pressure on the system that maybe under a, a different a different year we wouldn't see. And so uh, we're trying to kind of unravel that and, and get a better sense. We'll be looking at doing flow monitoring and also maybe some groundwater monitoring because that's going to help us into the future to use data to predict when or the severity of events that we might have. Because there's always going to be challenges moving forward and we want to try and make sure we have the best information we can to try and um, eliminate all those backups. So. So that's what we're working on. So any questions, I'll uh, do it. Councilor Parko, Councilor Earl. Thanks, uh, Kevin. Um, one of uh, the things that I think is incorporated in flooding, and I, I know we'd, we're talking about trying to improve the flow of water through the community, but I was uh, telling uh, as CAO about something I saw on TV where some communities have got through their emergency response program barriers to protect property and um, then uh, excuse me saying this but then you referred to Grand Forks as, a, as an example the one I was thinking of because I wondered if I was thinking about Grand Forks as well but it, uh, something I saw a Federation of Canadian Municipalities on what they did in Gatineau Quebec um, but we as a council, you know, we, we, we take flooding, sewage, very serious problem. There's no doubt about it. But we haven't had a talk about as a backup plan because we know so much of Dawson Creek is built in a floodplain. Um, is there a way we can, we need to, what's the word, look at? the option and benefits, if there are any, of having some response that is, uh, we can pr quickly put up barriers that will protect property. Mm -hmm. um, as I recall it, they were seem to be a, a series of stanchions that went into the ground and then something was stretched between them and then they had a few pumps the other side of it and they were able to protect the downtown of this community in, in Quebec. And then there are problems with Grand Force, but we haven't we haven't explored that topic. Is that something we need to have in our palette of responses? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I'm throwing that out as as something that uh, we I think we need to need to talk yeah. about. So that is is definitely it's highlighted in the um, the report from Epwater about you know mitigating flood risk and those so, uh, it's on the radar and I've also chatted you know Blair and I chatted with Duncan about it um, because once he got to Grand Forks he was thrown into what they're dealing with and obviously they got some significant issues and and so um, he's given us some contacts of a consultant that deals just with uh, flood barriers essentially um, and there's different types there's aqua barriers where they fill up basically these tubes uh, full of water that then become like a dike and there's different things um, different approaches that you can do and so it's definitely on the radar and, and we're going to reach out to this individual and see if essentially the way Duncan illustrated is that um, uh, this individual would come to your community and basically walks and looks and is able to provide um, a bit of a plan on where you could place some of these things and if they would indeed you know assist the, again the challenges are is, and what we need to understand is is how long does it take to deploy because what we saw in the two events we had this year is from the, the time it starts raining to the time that we typically see the creek breach and come over is about eight hours uh, during those significant events so you have about so first of all you're dealing with the immediate response of the rain and sewers and vac trucks and all that and then you know what else is coming and so uh, we need to look and see how long it takes to deploy that, what kind of resources you'd need to do it, and, and then you can look at how you would uh, respond. Very good. Well, I, was, I mean, my, my, my hope is that uh, we, we have a great administrative team in this city, and I do hope we can communicate this, though, to the general public, that things are happening 
where preparations are being made, improvements are made, but we need to communicate it. And maybe I would wager that if an area of town is under threat of frequent floods, you could probably get a community action team to, to mobilized or in place trained to ins help in store because uh, it's their property that's that's under threat, right? Um, but anyway, I'm I'm pleased, but I'd like people to understand the general public to understand that the mayor and council are taking this flooding and sewage issue very seriously, and we have some w things we're working on. I think is it. There's a, always a communication piece. I think that it's added work, but I think it's important because I think people need to have confidence that the mayor council and its staff are, are, are addressing these issues. Thank you. Councilor Erkel? Good. Any other comments, questions? Kevin, two things I got to request. Uh, people were uh, Brookside Cemetery. There was a bunch of staking going on down there, and so we do that at both cemeteries prior to winter because w once it snows, and depending how much it snows, and we have to go in and find. Okay, we're doing that just to identify, identify. and protect headstones so we okay. don't run into things. Awesome. I thought that was the case, but I just wanted to confirm. Yep. The other one, when I was in Calgary about a year ago, and maybe it was about this time. It was early in the fall, when, and I was walking downtown, and they had employed these really small Kubota uh, units with the sweepers on them. They were, they were really tiny, but they were using them on their sidewalks to do their cleaning. They were quick and they were really mm -hmm. efficient. And I wondered if that was something we did. And why, why it struck me was because I look on our tender this year and we purchased another new tractor for the uh, lawn, it looks like for the street sweeping or the sidewalks and stuff. And I think we use them for uh, grass cutting units as well. But I wondered if that was ever a consideration or a thought to look at them because uh, I know how these bigger equipment, they're much more expensive to purchase one as well as to operate. And I wondered if that was ever a consideration to look at as an option for doing those sidewalks because they seemed, they were much, very quick and uh, a lot smaller, so I'm assuming. S summertime operation? Is it what No, it they were winter. They were oh, using winter. them on their sweeping the sidewalks downtown Calgary. Okay. And uh, like I say, they were small, um, and they had about a two foot uh, broom on them. Right. But very, very quick. And, and that's what I got thinking about for our sidewalks, because um, I know that two sweeps with them, uh, with that one, uh, would. Right. Anyway, it was just, a, I didn't know if that was ever something you'd ever looked at for ours. So, so in the downtown, it's uh, of course we require that the um, businesses, property owners down there, maintain the sidewalks. Um, residential areas, people are supposed to maintain the sidewalk, but we only respond to them if we get some complaints. And then we have our within the snow plowing policy, we have the ones that are defined, which are the more arterial ones, and that's right. where we use the trackless machine. And that's I was even thinking about them for yeah. that, right? In yeah. terms of Eighth Street and Alaska Avenue, where okay. if you had a little smaller machine that was quicker, might be a little less operating costs and capital. I just sure. like I say, I wasn't sure if something to take a look at. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Can Councillor Parker. Yeah. Yep. One Sorry. Just reading from the minutes of our last council meeting, council meeting, it states Councillor Parsler requested updates on the following items at the next committee of the whole meeting. Flood mitigation update, including what options are available and comfortable with that plans for the upcoming fiscal year regarding storm sewage. Um, so question there fiscally is, uh, do we have sufficient money in that utility to cover what is imagined here, mm -hmm. or will we have to secure extra money? So just- You're not at that stage yet. Yeah. So with storm sewer, we don't have any large projects planned. What we have been doing is as we look at the road network that we're going to work on, we look to see if there's any upgrades, uh, upsizings or anything that's driven out of the master plans that need to be done within that corridor. And we do that as we go. Um, and that's essentially what we've been trying to chip away at. So, so then the issue this year was nothing to do really with overloading the storm sewer. It was just our sanitary sewer. Is that what I'm hearing? So during the events, the storm sewers, there would have been storm sewers that would have been overwhelmed 
guaranteed because you would have saw some bubbling out of manholes and some but when that happens it also comes up and then it runs on the road and it, you know it ends up somewhere and as long as that's not coming off the road and into people's properties that's not causing us an issue so i don't believe there i'm not saying it didn't happen in a couple of maybe locations uh like you go down to 106th and 8th street that's always a pinch point when we get those major thunderstorms but other than that those were not the the crux of our our major issues it really um it's the water getting into the sanitary system and then in turn causing backups that were the bigger issues Okay, the, the final one, which uh, I don't know if, if you plan on addressing it somewhere else in the agenda, was the multiplex facility. I'm not dealing with the operation issues, which we know about. I'm talking about uh, what I'm told is future challenges around maintenance and what do we need to be doing around the future maintenance of the facility what spawned this um, was, of course, the issues that uh, CAOs reported on it as it relates to the water issues with the Lakota Center. But um, I recall the previous CAO saying that the building is showing its age, there are settling issues, and that we're going to have to be spending some money on that. So I, I would just wonder if his timely that we have an assessment of that entire complex from the point of view of the facility and we begin to budget for what might be coming down the pipe it just seems that uh, it's our major community asset uh, is it something we need to treat like our f we have for flooding setting aside some money so that we have the capacity to deal with it? Or is this just uh, unfounded, uh, largely unfounded concerns? I don't know. I just thought we'd better talk about it. I think, I mean, I'll just jump in then, Ross, I'll get you to go into more detail. Uh, council has had the discussion and it has been uh, part of the budgetary discussions that council is going to look at some capital uh, I guess replacement funds, um, looking at what has to take place, whether it's the Encana Center, the swimming pool, the memorial or kin arenas. Right now, part of that discussion is to establish long-term capital funds for that replacement. Um, those will take many years to develop to the funds and the amount needed. Uh, but ongoing capital maintenance is something we work on each year. I know right now that uh, Ross is working uh, diligently on the Lakota Center with the work that's ongoing there but the overall uh, center I'll let you uh, if you have anything um, that jumps out at you Ross uh, thank you and, and through your worship I, I believe that uh, the multiplex the folks the, the facility staff at the multiplex have a good sense of repairs and ongoing capital works that need to be done and I think our capital budget reflects that in the last couple of years they've been making some improvements to keep that uh, facility in an operational state uh, the Lakota is something I think that uh, the city has been aware of water issues for a number of years there I think that most of those issues have been mitigated in the Encana proper but not at the Lakota Center so we are exploring and I've identified some capital funds in the 2021 budget to start doing some further work in that area but I think the pool the Encana I think they've got a pretty good grasp on those major you know issues uh, cladding roofing HVAC uh, those types of things specific thing was that got my attention was the word settling issues Again, to your worship, and I believe we've been aware of those for some time. It's water underneath that building. Uh, I've been looking back at previous reports. I think there were some uh, drainage components that were not installed as designed originally, so there's been some mitigation after the fact. I think in the case of the, the Lakota Center, it appears that the drain tile in that case 
was eliminated and then put back into the contract but put on the inside of the foundation which is not helping us with our drainage concerns uh, and again I'm diving back into these reports I've looked and spoken with enough people to suggest that there is water migrating through that parking lot and running down right beside the Lakota at the end of that building so we've started to do some of that work right now and I've just earmark some uh, a good chunk of change next year to keep to continue down that road and protect our investment thank you councillor earl uh just a quick follow-up for kev in the water and environmental graphs they only go to may is that yeah through your worship i noticed that as well and i'm sorry i i'll uh I'll have to find out why. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that one at the particular moment. We'll, keep, we'll get them updated and flip them out to council. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And so that concludes our Committee of the Whole uh, reports. Thank you, everybody. And at this time, we will uh, recess to close. Move to Councillor Parzo, second Councillor Earl. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you.